a young man named Ichijo finds himself in a difficult situation as he witnesses an attack by a minotaur. He's assaulted by the creature and nearly devoured. As his life comes to an end, he makes a wish to be reborn in a new world. He dreams of battling magical creatures, marrying royalty, and experiencing incredible adventures. In his final moments, the Minotaur gruesomely consumes both halves of his body. Amidst the darkness, he sees a holographic status board, displaying unusual information confirming his first death and his affinity with another world. The board reveals that he has unlocked a unique skill called Return from Hell. Slowly, Ichijo awakens to find himself back in his office. He's filled with confusion and sweat, and he struggles to catch his breath. Looking down at his legs, he feels a mix of shock and relief to see them still attached to his upper body. He wonders if he might have experienced a nightmare. At that moment, his co-worker Sayama gets his attention and signals him to glance behind. Before Ichijo can react, a woman sneakily seizes him by the neck, wrapping her arms around him in a move like a sleeper hold submission. He instantly recognizes the woman as Nanase, his office director, and realizes that her playful grip is incredibly strong. She asks why he's been ignoring her and spacing out, and also asks if he's not feeling well. Releasing her grip, he collapses to the ground, struggling to catch his breath. He exclaims that he was merely feeling drowsy, but her unexpected strong grip has him wide awake now. Teasingly, she playfully suggests to him if he'd like her to make him sleep forever, and he politely turns down the offer. Ichijo reflects on the moments just before he wakes up at his desk and finds his nightmare strangely unsettling, as he still feels the sensation of him being chewed alive. Nanase leans in uncomfortably close, questioning whether he's certain he didn't push himself too hard. He looks away, mentioning that he'll submit his office report by the day's end. She gently holds his face, pointing out the dark circles under his eyes, emphasizing the importance of looking after his health and taking good care of his body. At that moment, Ichijo experiences an odd sensation that he's had the exact same conversation before. After Nanase departs, Sayama approaches Ichijo with jealousy, desiring similar care from her. Ichijo advises Sayama to complete his task swiftly, or else he might be sent flying. On his way home, Ichijo notices an uncanny sense of familiarity with the events happening around him, almost like a repetition of past experiences. He wonders whether it's just his mind playing tricks due to his age. Walking down a dim, desolate path, he suddenly hears the unmistakable sound of metal scraping against the ground. Puzzled by the noise, he contemplates whether something heavy is being dragged towards him. However, due to the darkness, he struggles to see easily. Suddenly, a gigantic and terrifying minotaur emerges right in front of him. This minotaur has a fierce and threatening appearance, holding a massive and blood-stained axe, indicating that it has been used to take a life. In that very moment, it dawns on Ichijo that the dream he thought he was having is, in fact, a chilling reality. With a deafening roar, the minotaur startles him, prompting him to react instinctively, his legs carrying him away as fast as they can. His singular focus is to avoid the clutches of death. In an astonishing move, the Minotaur leaps into the air and then lands forcefully just behind him. Using its immense axe, it strikes Ichijo with such brutal strength that he is sent hurtling through the air, crashing into a nearby wall, and the impact causes him to cough up blood. Afterward, all he feels is the intense pain engulfing his senses, making it hard to even breathe. Desperate to hold on to life, he attempts to move, but his legs won't obey. In a jolt of terror, he gazes ahead and sees his lower body on the ground. His heart sinks as he watches the Minotaur grab his lower half and devour it before his eyes. Puzzled by the way things turned out, he strangely remembers that he's still a virgin. His vision blurs, making him wonder if this is how he'll meet his end. As he edges toward darkness, a hologram status board materializes, announcing a new quest, Minotauro, urging him to defeat the Minotaur for clearance. Confusion fills Ichijo's mind. He's unsure about the hologram's quest concept and how he can face the Minotaur when his fate seems sealed. Ichijo is baffled, wondering what the hologram means by quest. He questions how he's expected to triumph over the Minotaur when his situation seems dire. As the Minotaur devours Ichijo, much to his dismay, he awakens once more in his office. The familiar hologram reappears before him, revealing the unsettling news of the quest failure. The reappearance of the hologram startles him, leaving him to wonder whether all that's happening is because of the monster. The status board vanishes briefly, only to re-emerge with fresh information. It confirms his second demise and presents him with a bronze trophy, unveiling a 5-point boost in his strength and defense. Confusion swirls in Ichijo's mind as he grapples with the meaning of these changes and the enigmatic nature of the board. Echoing a past occurrence, Nanase once again approaches him, inquiring if he has been paying attention to her and what she was saying. Ichijo is confused by the hologram status board that is floating in front of him. He points at it and demands that Nanase tell him what it means. She looks at him blankly and asks him what he is talking about. This confirms Ichijo's suspicion that he is the only one who can see the board. He jokingly insults her for not being able to see it. She responds by putting him in a submission hold. 
Later on, Ichijo seeks solace on a bench, piecing together the events that have unfolded. The recurring pattern of returning to his office becomes clear. He reaches a realization that heading home would expose him to the Minotaur's attack. This dilemma prompts him to think about his next course of action, and eventually, later finally decides that he is not going home. He decides to head back into the office because there are still possibilities that he might get attacked outside. Not wanting to believe he's the sole survivor, he seeks help by calling out to anyone nearby. At the vending machine area, he spots Hayama on a bench, and he is initially relieved. But as he approaches casually, his relief turns to horror as he sees a goblin pulling out and eating from the inside of Sayama's dead body. Ichijo covers his mouth to stifle a scream, retching in shock. Spotting him, the goblin advances. Facing imminent danger, he thinks about his options, realizing that if he doesn't act fast, he would die. With no alternative, he resolves to confront and defeat the goblin to ensure his survival. He recalls from video games that goblins are typically classified as the weakest kind of monsters. However, being face to face with it in real life, he lacks confidence in his ability to win against it. Overwhelmed by fear, he collapses into the ground, letting out pathetic screams as he begs the goblin to stay away from him. Despite his pleas, the creature hurls itself at him with determination. In a desperate bid for safety, he hurls his phone at the goblin, and it bounces off the goblin's head, but it doesn't have any effect whatsoever on it. The goblin lands on top of him, clamping onto his neck. Without wasting any time, the goblin grabs its wooden club and delivers a forceful blow to Ichijo's head causing instant bleeding. The goblin appears momentarily preoccupied with something, capturing Ichijo's attention as his thoughts linger on the reason why the goblin was wandering aimlessly, but he decides to seize the golden opportunity to strike while it's off guard. Without hesitation, Ichijo delivers a powerful blow, causing the goblin to hurl several meters through the air before colliding with a nearby wall. The sheer force of the blow astonishes Ichijo, as he doesn't recognize his newfound strength, and also puzzled by his unexpected survival after the goblin's brutal assault. He speculates on the role of the status board from the previous day having something to do with his newfound strength. As the goblin attempts to move, Ichijo is determined not to grant it a fighting chance. Swiftly, he launches another assault, this time wielding the goblin's own club to repeatedly smash its head until it turns into a shapeless puddle. Following the goblin's demise, Ichijo collapses to the ground, overcome by a mixture of pain, exhaustion, and lingering bloodlust. As he lies there, thinking about the possibility of his impending death, a board materializes before him once again. This display relays the information that his level has ascended from 1 to 3. Additionally, it announces his attainment of a bronze trophy for his victory in subjugating a monster for the first time. Notably, his strength undergoes another uptick, this time by an additional 5 points. Ichijo suddenly feels an enormous amount of power flowing through his body, so much that he begins to lose consciousness because he can't hold on anymore. Ichijo awakens once again, only to find himself back at the same starting point as the day before. Following the pattern of the two previous instances, Nanase inquires about his well-being. Ignoring her concern, Ichijo rushes outdoors. He goes to the rooftop, greeted by the persistent nighttime setting, the final eve before the world's impending demise. Overwhelmed, his knees become weak and he collapses to the ground, grappling with the puzzling question of how to break free from the unending cycle of this distressing ordeal. Once more, the status board emerges in front of him, displaying his stats along with the amassed points he has earned. Ichijo comes to a realization that despite his death, his levels remain intact and his hard-earned points and stats endure across his attempts. He thinks about the uncanny resemblance of these events to a gaming scenario, but ultimately concludes that surrendering now would be premature. He resolves to persevere, driven by an unwavering determination to endure at any and all costs. Ichijo returns to his office desk, deep in thought about the impending end of the world in just a few hours. He engages in a soliloquy, murmuring to himself about his determination not to surrender and his unwavering resolve to survive. However, his words of courage are abruptly interrupted, as Nanase delivers a forceful blow to his head using a rolled-up newspaper magazine. She scolds him for raising his voice within the office premises, pointing out that everyone else has already left for the day. Attempting to cover up, he fibs that he still has a significant workload left to tackle. Pleading with her to leave first, he asks that she goes home. Nanase probes further, questioning whether he intends to endure another all-nighter. In a swift motion, she seizes his files, telling him to go home and assuring him that she'll assist in expediting the task's completion. He makes a last-ditch effort to voice his disagreement, yet she fixes him with a stern, icy gaze and instructs him firmly to head home. He decides to succumb to the pressure and gives in, well aware of her intimidating demeanor when she's upset. In a flash, he remembers that rushing home might result in an encounter with the Minotaur. He makes a funny pose and calls out the word status because, from past experiences, the status seems to react to words. Much to his surprise, the status board materializes before him in an unexpected turn of events. Looking at the board, he notices that his individual level has reset to 1, yet his cumulative level remains at 3. 
He feels content about his strength and stamina outweighing his other attributes displayed on the board. Curious, he puts forth a hypothesis. A simple touch to the screen might unveil the effects of his skills. His hypothesis proves accurate as information about his distinctive ability, Go Back to Hell, appears on the screen. Return from Hell, also known as Go Back to Hell, is a passive ability that activates when the skill owner meets their demise. It enables the individual to traverse back to a designated moment in the past. This peculiar skill warps the entire chain of cause and effect, distorting the very fabric of reality. Ichijo wonders why the force guiding him back after each demise consistently transports him back to the office. In a moment of insight, he swipes the board and realizes that any new message disappears upon a swipe. Intrigued, he delves further into his stats displayed on the board. His attention is soon captured by the appearance of a new abilities icon. Acting on curiosity, he taps the icon, revealing a catalog of additional abilities on the display, each accompanied by an option to be selected. In the middle of going through the names of newfound potential abilities, Nanase suddenly passes by and calls out to him, catching him off guard. He begins to panic briefly as he fears that she would find out about the board, but then he remembers that only he can see it. Nanase asks why he was still around the office and why he hasn't already gone home. He tells her he was waiting for her to be done before he leaves, heaving a sigh of frustration. She asks him if he still abides by the company's motto, and then he remembers that there was once a motto that instructed workers not to leave their bosses behind and go home first. After some time, Ichijo bids her farewell and shifts his attention towards finding a way to level up. However, just as he's leaving, Nanase calls him back just to let him know that he shouldn't hesitate to confide in her if anything ever troubles him. Once she departs, he proceeds to a store where he purchases essential survival items, a strategy he plans to uphold until his level improves. Determining the office as a suitable makeshift base for his leveling journey, he spends time scouring the web for updates on monster-related news. Among the various stories, he stumbles upon reports of disturbing creatures like a dragon sighting in China. At 3am, he decides to finally leave the office and go level up. He readies himself by donning protective gear, comprising a helmet and a handful of kitchen knives, before venturing out into the street. As he moves along the street, he takes note that it's not in chaos as much as he thought it would be. Nevertheless, he resolves to press onward, because he knows that the monster is definitely lurking somewhere. Just as he predicted, a shocking scene unfolds before his eyes. Suddenly, he sees a man inside a car, his head neatly severed, an unsettling sight that instantly churns Ichijo's stomach. Despite the urge to vomit, he braces himself, reminding himself that he needs to get used to such gruesome scenes as they are likely to become a daily occurrence. Amidst the unsettling moment, a commotion breaks out down the street capturing Ichijo's attention. He realizes that goblins are causing chaos, threatening two police officers who are trying to protect civilians. He hesitates initially, uncertain about whether he should intervene. He questions his ability to face a group of five goblins at once, especially considering the officers are armed with guns and can defend themselves. Yet, in that critical moment, the notification board reappears, presenting him with new information about a fresh quest. This time, he is assigned the task of defeating 100 E-class goblins scattered throughout the vicinity. Success is crucial for clearing the stage and progressing further in his journey. He's utterly astounded by the fact that he's expected to defeat 100 goblins, finding the task rather implausible. The goblins begin attacking innocent civilians. Amid the chaos, a police officer takes a shot at one of the goblins, hitting it squarely in the forehead, causing it to collapse instantly. Curious, he approaches the fallen goblin to confirm it's dead. Suddenly, the goblin springs back to life, lunging at the officer and plunging its dagger into his face. This shocking encounter jolts Ichijo awake, prompting him to run away as he now realizes that even bullets are ineffective against these creatures, leading him to opt for escape. Confronted with the reality that he stands no chance against such odds, he reluctantly admits that he prioritizes his own survival over others' lives. However, fate intervenes as he spots Nanase in the crowd. As she collapses to the ground, Ichijo witnesses a profound horror etched onto her face, precisely as a goblin lunges forward, ready to strike her. Acting instinctively, Ichijo swiftly propels himself towards the scene, he tries to grab the goblin, yet the creature's acute perception detects his footsteps and evades his blow with remarkable agility. Nanase is shocked to find him there, and he urgently instructs her to flee the impending danger. He reminds her about the company's motto, stressing the importance of never leaving their boss behind. Fueled by the memories of Nanase's consistent care for him, Ichijo decides that this time he would protect her. He faces off against five goblins. Displaying astonishing brawn, Ichijo masterfully executes a single forceful stroke, each goblin succumbing to the blow and collapsing in rapid succession. He dashes towards Nanase, urgently yelling at her to hurry and run. Nanase notices that the goblins he previously fought are back up again, and she is shocked that he wasn't able to kill any, but he tells her that there's no way he can beat up that amount of goblins. The goblins advance menacingly, prompting Ichijo to swiftly scoop up Nanase, securing her on his back in a piggyback fashion. Then he tells her that they must escape together. Nanase's cheeks flush with embarrassment as she becomes self-conscious about her weight. She shifts uncomfortably, but Ichijo tells her to be patient and ensures he will guide her safely back to the company headquarters. 
which somehow remains a secure haven. Without a moment's hesitation, he swiftly takes off with her riding on his back as he skillfully evades the onslaught of attacks launched by the advancing goblins. As they run, Nanase chastises him for recklessness. She emphasizes that a single misstep could have cost him his life. He chuckles and offers an apology, but she thanks him for saving her life. Nanase says something quietly, but not being able to fully hear her, he asks what she said. She denies the fact that she said anything, and she tells him to stop staring at her. While the duo continues their hurried escape, Ichijo wonders if he can protect Nanase in this type of crazy world. Meanwhile, somewhere else in the chaos, a man is hiding in a sack while fiddling with something he found, searching for certain information. Amidst the city shrouded in smoke and crumbling gradually, a dilapidated helicopter hovers across the scene. Inside an office, Ichijo cradles his boss, now, who is clearly in pain. With an earnest attempt to help, he tries to alleviate her discomfort, but her cries reveal his touch isn't hitting the mark. No more there, please! It hurts! Now implores, her voice a mix of distress and frustration. Ichijo, determined, encourages her to tough it out, as if endurance were as simple as snapping one's fingers. Just a little longer, he assures, his words a blend of optimism and reassurance. After a moment, he sets her down, done with his first aid. He tells her how the wound on her injured leg won't be fatal, and she agrees that she already feels much better. She thanks him for his help, and he states he's come prepared. He's brought food and drinks. He states they'll have to eat them in moderation as he unwraps the stash of goodies. It's a shock to his boss. She didn't expect him to be so prepared for an unfortunate event that took place spontaneously. She then spots something and questions him about it. He asks her what's wrong as he hasn't seen what alerted her yet, but she in return growls out his name and he momentarily panics. Then she lifts it up for him to see. It's the adult magazine he'd purchased earlier. She expresses she can't believe he had the time to buy that too. He snatches it from her hands, flustered and stammering out words. Now tells him there's no need to be shy. She was only a bit surprised. He's free to purchase stuff like that as she considers it normal. On the streets, everything appears peaceful with cars driving to and fro. Ichijo takes a peek through the window and now questions him about his findings. She wants to know if the formidable monsters are still out there. Ichijo reports everything appears fine for now. He closes the curtains and states it has just occurred to him that it was quite weird that his boss was at the convenience store in the middle of the night. She replies she spent the night at work trying to stay up to go out and shop. Inwardly, Ichijo is grateful that he thought ahead to buy all the stuff they currently have. Now is still on the floor with her knees drawn to her chest, in a state of trauma. She tells Ichijo that she watched a lot of people die right in front of her. Everything was like normal and routine until those pesky monsters showed up from nowhere. She questions why they showed up in the first place. Ichijo replies he doesn't have the answer to that, but they attacked and ate a lot of people. He also recalls that firearms were useless against the beasts, and whatever human defense they had was worthless. The invasion isn't just the city, but the entire world. In the near future, or as now steps in to correct, the next morning, the world as they know it would end. For Ichijo, it's quite a disbelief that the world is actually ending. Everyone is going to die, and he wonders if that includes his dear now. The thought of her going too reignites fear in him. He hurries to the corner and finds her resting, half asleep, and puts a blanket around her, promising he'll see her in the morning. If there's anything he's learned from dying thrice, it's that they'll be safe in the office until the following morning. To survive further, he'll need to raise his level. A wave of tiredness hits him and he sits down for a while before staring at the clock and concluding he can't rest for long under given circumstances. Seeing now is enough to jolt him back to his feet. He tells her he's sure he'll be back alive and she should rest for a little longer. She sleepily asks him to wait, but his duty to protect her is stronger, so he leaves. He goes out into the desolate streets with a knife in his hand and a determination to level up. He's sure he can beat the goblins alone and is ready to multitask, fighting other species of monsters he finds. As he moves, he takes note of a lot of shouting and gunshots in the urban area. He decides he'll stay clear from such an area for now. He hides behind an abandoned car when he sees flying monsters carrying human corpses with their insect legs. It's a rather gross sight. Their beaks are pierced through the corpses so they can easily fly across with them. Whizzing by Ichijo, these airborne creatures ignite a spark of wonder. Where is their destination with those lifeless forms? A valuable lesson emerges. Skywatching is a must. However, a stroll out in the open is like waving a welcome monster's flag. Alleys? Nah, they're trap-infested playground for man-eating plants. The remedy? Nix the alleys and stick to the curbs, a safer avenue for monster encounters on the lower difficulty setting. It's all part of the plan to boost his stats and level up, a strategic pursuit as high noon approaches, ticking away like an invisible hourglass. Time is of the essence, and our hero's got no intention of letting it slip through his fingers. As Ichijo sprints ahead, he spots what seems like a car at first glance, but reality twists into a wild surprise. It's a freaky monster primed for trouble and heading right for him. Panic flares up and he grasps the harsh truth. Nowhere to hide, 
only a dance of evasion. He darts away, the beast's breath hot on his neck, narrowly slipping into an abandoned building's refuge. It's a crazy twist of fate, monsters popping out of thin air like dandelions in spring. High noons creeping in fast, like an impatient visitor. Time, ever the swift sprinter, races onward, a ticking reminder of urgency. A goblin steps out of the shadows in the convenience store he took refuge in. His first instinct is to run, but then he quickly realizes he shouldn't. This is his opportunity and the moment he was actually anticipating. If he doesn't start fighting sooner than later, he won't be able to level up. The goblin is unarmed and it seems there are more lurking around. He pulls out his knife and decides he can take down the goblin. The goblin lurches to attack, and Ichijo sees his vitals are abnormal. Stabbing it in the chest or neck won't cut it. The way to kill it is to make a clean slice across the neck from ear to ear. The task proves difficult for Ichijo. Kitchen knives are too blunt for the goblin's skin. Ichijo continues to wrestle the goblin and is finally able to decapitate it. The fight raises his stat from a level 1 to 2, but he's not necessarily pumped. He still feels strange having to kill monsters. He hears a noise and sees a bloodied woman crawl out of the shadows. He quickly locates a stash of corpses just like the woman's. He remembers the monster wasps, which have been taking their corpses to a lair of their own. Ichijo has stepped into a goblin's lair, and to prove his point, the monsters step out of the shadows in their numbers. Ichijo faces a dire situation as goblins swarm around him, their hungry eyes fixated on their potential meal. His mind races to find a solution, and he decides to pull off a daring move. With a dramatic point towards an imaginary object in the distance, he hopes to distract the goblins and make a quick escape. But his clever ruse falls flat as the goblins remain unfazed, seeing through the illusion. Without hesitation, Ichijo bolts into action, running like a gazelle with the surge of adrenaline. The goblins charge after him, their menacing growls echoing in his ears. Drawing upon his past experiences, he taps into his inner athlete, channeling the speed and determination that once made him a star in the national athletics competition. Ichijo navigates through the obstacle with finesse, his heart pounding as he races towards the exit. Memories of his triumphant moments on the track fuel his determination, encouraging him to push his limits and leave the pursuing goblins behind. Ichijo maintains a determined rhythm, silently encouraging himself as the exit draws near. Just when he thought things were looking up, a sudden twist of fate throws a curveball his way. Two gruesome goblins materialize out of thin air, blocking his path to freedom and forcing him into a heart-pounding predicament. With his option dwindling like campfire on its last embers, he contemplates a risky leap from the building's second-story window. Adrenaline courses through his veins as he sprints toward the stairs, his heart racing faster than a hummingbird's wings. Yet, it's a race against time, and the menacing goblins hot on his heels are no slouches either. The staircase becomes a battleground as he navigates each step with a mix of urgency and desperation. The goblins, like relentless shadows, inch closer and closer, making his situation more dire than a cliffhanger in a suspense novel. Cornered like a mouse in a trap, Ichijo finds himself surrounded on the stairway, the goblins closing in like a pack of ravenous wolves. The walls seem to close in on him as panic bubbles up, threatening to consume him whole. In this heart-stopping moment, he can't help but wonder if this is the end of the road, a fourth brush with death that's as unwelcome as a surprise pop quiz. Ichijo's resolve solidifies like steel in a fiery forge. With a heavy sigh and a sense of grim determination, he makes a life-altering decision. The odds stacked against him, he reluctantly accepts his fate and resigns himself to yet another harrowing journey to the abyss. It's a bittersweet realization, a plunge into darkness that's as chilling as the suspenseful twist in a thriller. And just when he's about to give up, he remembers now. If he dies, who will protect her? He had promised to protect her, to return back to her. Now gives him the zeal to push past the flesh-eating monsters and keep running. He can't afford to die. He has to fight. Ichijo's mind races to find a weapon against the looming monsters, urgency fueling his thoughts. With panic gripping him, he summons his status bar in a desperate move, the display materializing before him. His physical enhancement, analysis, body strengthening, and appraisal appear, each marked at level 1. Time ticks away and a surge of determination takes hold. Without hesitation, Ichijo launches into the air, his ascent swift and determined. With a focused energy, he plummets towards the goblins, his strike landing with a powerful impact that scatters them in all directions. The room settles into an eerie calm as he touches down, his chest heaving with effort. Surveying the aftermath, a mix of relief and weariness washes over him. The once menacing goblins lie defeated across the floor, their threat extinguished. It's a victorious moment that shines like a beacon of accomplishment, a testament to his resourcefulness and the strength he possesses within. Ichijo's status bar reveals a surge in points across different abilities, from strength to stamina. He's left in awe by the transformative effect of a single attack, marveling at the newfound might coursing through his veins. The revival of some goblins though serves as a reminder that the battle persists. Undeterred, a surge of determination propels Ichijo forward, 
his confidence radiating like a beacon. Facing the reanimated goblins, he charges ahead with unwavering resolve. Each strike and parry fuel his momentum, pushing him further into the heart of the fight. His determination soars, like a phoenix rising from the ashes, and he vows to bring this confrontation to a decisive end. Ichijo's relentless assault continues, his movements fluid and calculated. As the clash rages on, a notification from his status bar catches his attention, like a glint of treasure in the dark. A bronze trophy symbolizes his achievement, the goblin's nemesis. Victory inches closer, and his heart swells with a mixture of accomplishment and anticipation. He calls out to any monsters possibly still hiding in the building to come out and face him as he is no longer afraid of any of them. His level has now been boosted from a level 2 to 4. His strength is at a 10, his endurance is 24, and stamina is 25. He's a bit disappointed because he's just defeated a whole load of monsters, so he thought his stats would be much higher. He gets another stats prompt that surprises him. It shows he's just finished a class E quest, defeat the goblins. There were a total of 100 goblins now defeated, and for that he has a reward. His initial shock becomes excitement over completing the quest and winning a trophy. He decides that whatever monster he was hoping to face next can wait. His priority is the cool reward he has now received. He opens it and sees an additional 10 points and a benefit of 2 extra points, making it 12 points in total. If he adds his 4 points from earlier, that's a total of 16 points from this fight. It feels like he's on cloud 9. With this many points, he will acquire many abilities. Against the type of goblins he just faced, he got an additional 3% damage increase which makes him deem himself a lucky man. He also has an additional 20% increase in power. On the streets of the city, monsters still roam. The Minotaur and the Nemesis are approaching with killing intent. Now that Ichijo has 16 points, he can divide them into ability values for the time being. Points are acquired when goblins are defeated. The points are then used to acquire abilities. Ichijo stands at a crossroads, curious and ambitious about the array of possibilities before him. Abilities of various kinds present themselves, offering a realm of new skills to explore. One particular ability catches his attention, the craft of making weapons and armor from raw monster materials. These passive skills hold the promise of creating potent creations. The allure of the skill captivates Ichijo, its potential shining brightly. As he progresses in his abilities, the technique at his disposal becomes more intricate, paving a path of mastery. Yet the road to attaining these coveted abilities is challenging. Mastery demands more than wishful thinking. It requires collecting essential monster materials, a pursuit that tests patience and dedication. Safety first, right? Ichijo's mental gears start churning as he contemplates the realm of possibilities. Crisis detection and enemy scouting abilities twinkle like tempting stars in his mind's sky. A light bulb moment illuminates his thoughts. These individual abilities aren't just static, they come with snazzy levels too. Speaking of levels, his physical strength gleams proudly at level 2, like a badge of honor he's earned. And then, just as he's starting to feel all powerful and fancy, the status bar pipes up with an offer that raises his eyebrows. Hey, wanna splash 20 points to level up, it teases? Ichijo blinks, a mix of confusion and disbelief fogging up his mental screen. 20 points? That's like trading in a herd of mythical unicorns for a single shiny pebble. Plus, those points were no walk in the park to gather in the first place. He practically had a front row seat to a roller coaster through hell. With a bemused shake of his head, Ichijo considers his options. Spending the points and morph into a superhero level dynamo, or stick with what he's got and embrace his inner everyday hero. It's a cosmic tug of war between ambition and pragmatism, and our fearless friend is at the center, navigating this mental maze with equal parts uncertainty and excitement. Who knew becoming a master of abilities could feel like a cosmic bargaining game? Ichijo's analysis ability sits comfortably at level 1. His experience points from goblin victories no longer sufficient for leveling up. Strengthening this skill intrigues him, a path toward comprehending his foe's strengths and thus executing more tactical battles. This newfound knowledge could pave the way to vanquishing monsters and unlocking further abilities. Another aspect beckons, elevating his physique from level 1 to 2, a goal requiring additional points. The mental labyrinth of possibilities swirls, but after contemplation, he decides to test the waters with his existing skills first. As his gaze falls upon a defeated goblin, a revelation dawns. His ability extends to viewing its status bar too. Glancing at his phone, the clock reads noon, and a pang of concern for now tugs at his thoughts. A decision is swiftly made. He must return to his workplace to ensure her well-being. As he steps into the street, the stage transforms. Two wolf beasts materialize, formidable opponents with stats towering above his own. The query hangs heavy in the air. Can he conquer this challenge, or will he meet his match? Just as he gears up for a showdown, those wolf beasts make a hasty exit. Strange, right? His head spins with wonder. Did they hightail it because they got spooked? Maybe his strength had them shaking in their furry boots. He's so caught up in this puzzle that he nearly forgets he's got a clear shot to make a dash for the work building. Strolling along, 
you can't help but notice the city's eerie quiet. No gunshots, no screams, no monster mayhem. Then, a sound. A sound he knows all too well. Twists his gut in dread. Slowly, he turns, and bam! There's the Minotaur, the granddaddy of intimidation. Suddenly, the silence makes sense. This big baddie's got everyone hiding. On the not-so-gloomy side, the Minotaur's still a good distance away, giving him a fighting chance to leg it out of there. Then he reconsiders. Is he really going to run away? He did just face a hundred goblins by himself. Maybe, just maybe, he can face the monster and defeat him. But as he goes closer, he sees the status bar of the Minotaur. Its resistance is 112 and its strength is 190. There's no way he can take that thing down. Ichijo bolts into motion, his feet pounding against the mound. The difference between the Minotaur and the goblins is like night and day. Swiftly, the Minotaur charges, bridging the gap, and with a powerful swing of its horns, sends Ichijo crashing through a building. Bloodied but unbroken, our determined hero keeps moving, an unrelenting force on a mission to find now. Ichijo notices a detail on his stats bar, indicating a reversal rate exceeding 1%. This revelation hints at the Minotaur regaining some of its original strength, like a pendulum swinging back towards its starting point. Inches away, the looming Minotaur edges closer, while Ichijo's voice fills the air with desperate pleas, a last-ditch effort to keep the beast at bay. The Minotaur stats reveal a doubling of its power, a chilling realization that it has become a more formidable opponent. The road ahead seems dim, a path leading towards an uncertain fate. The specter of death looms as Ichijo, now facing this dire circumstance for the fourth time, braces himself for what might be his ultimate showdown. Suddenly, Ichijo's eyes snap open with a start and leaps back from his chair into his boss. Now, still in shock and not realizing that he is back in the office yet, Mao slaps him, asking him what on earth he is doing. She then continues to scold him in a belligerent manner, asking him what he would do if a staff member saw them. She then leaves the office, leaving Ichijo to himself. At first, he still thinks he has not died yet and decides to let the Minotaur kill him. At that point, he then realizes he has already died and has been revived, and is suddenly scared out of his mind. He recalls the sudden and exponential increase of the Minotaur's strength, from level 45 to level 80. He also recalls that there was a notification showing that the world reversal rate has exceeded 17%. He then wonders if an increase in the world reversal rate causes the monsters to become stronger. Ichijo comes to the conclusion that as time passes, the monsters will inevitably get stronger. He then decides to run away because winning against them is futile. Later in the night, he gets a taxi and tells the driver, Axel, to go to Kanagawa Prefecture. He makes plans to go as far away from the city and possibly take Nao with him if he does find a safe place. Suddenly, Axel informs him that there's a wild boar on the street, which he finds strange because it is rare to find a wild boar in town. Ichijo turns to look at the road, only to see a giant level 12 wild boar. He then realizes that the monsters have begun appearing. He can't help but have the feeling that something bad is going to happen. Suddenly, the taxi comes to a halt. When Ichijo asks what's wrong, Axel, sweat running down his face, can only look in horror and exclaim. When Ichijo leans forward to look at the front view, he is shocked to see a car split cleanly in half. Both Axel and Ichijo were terrified to see a level 37 orc standing in the middle of the split car. Ichijo then tells Axel to drive away quickly. Although shaken, Axel tries to make a getaway. However, just before they could escape from the scene, the orc leaps to the side of the car and flattens it with one swing of its weapon, brutally killing both Axel and Ichijo. He is then revived and woken up again by now, back in the office, as though nothing had happened. Later that day, he gets on a train, realizing that Kanagawa Prefecture is not safe either, and thinking that hopefully, he would not encounter any monsters there. With only one thought occupying his mind, escaping the city. Escaping to a place far, far away from that city. All seems well until all of a sudden, the train begins to tilt and jerk. The other people in fear and wonder of what is happening. But only Ichijo with a terrified look on his face could guess what was happening. The monsters have appeared again. This time, it was a giant baboon, which places one of the compartments of the train between its giant teeth and crushes it in an instant, killing everyone, including Ichijo. Again, Ichijo was woken up, back in the office as though he had never died. Beginning to panic, he continued to make many other attempts to escape the city, all to no avail. On one attempt, he was killed by a giant spider. In another, a bat-winged humanoid creature killed him, and in yet another, he was killed by a minotaur again. He tried escaping by ship, but as always, he was killed, this time by a kraken. He then concludes that all his attempts to escape are just as futile as trying to defeat the monsters. All surrounding towns were plagued by their monsters, so one way or another, he was going to die. Even hiding from the monsters proved to be futile, because they will find him in the end. It was as though there was no end to his suffering, as though he is only reincarnated just to die again. It was truly hell on earth. Later, after he was revived yet again, in the night, he is slumped in his chair, dejected. Now worriedly asks him if he is alright, and all he says is that he's going home. 
as he walks out of the door, now still watches him, wondering if he's alright. He then decides to test one more method, which is suicide. His idea is that if he dies by his own hand, then surely he will finally be able to get out of this hell. Whether it will work or not, he has no idea, but at this point, he's willing to try anything. With desperation in his sunken eyes, he quickly makes his way to the roof of the office building. Leaning over the edge, he braces himself, closes his eyes, and prays to God to let him die. Suddenly, a hand grabs onto him and pulls him back, preventing Ichijo from jumping. It was now, dragging him from the edge of the building and asking him what he thinks he's doing. Frustrated, Ichijo asks her what she's doing, now refuses to answer and continues to struggle with him. Ichijo continues to ask her why he is at the roof with him, but all she's concerned about is getting him to safety. When all is said and done, Ichijo's frustration is replaced with worry and asks now if she's okay, as she's on her knees trying to catch her breath. She then tells him that it's not that she does not like him, but simply because she feels hot. Ichijo decides to accept this answer, although he does not quite understand her statement. Pushing that aside, now then says that she is glad her intuition that he might kill himself was spot on. Ichijo denies this, saying that he was simply trying to get some fresh air. Now then asks him if he is free and decides to have a drink with him, saying that it has been a long time since they did so and tells him it's her orders as his boss, so he cannot refuse. Later at the pub, now orders two large glasses of beer. Seeing Ichijo still having a despairing look on his face, she takes off her jacket and tells him to drink as much as he wants and to not hold back. He tells her that he is not in the mood to drink and that he finds all of this meaningless. Meanwhile, the waiter meets them and apologizes for the wait and gives them their drinks, saying that it is a fresh batch. Now then tells him that she understands, telling him that he is free to go home or jump out of a window or do whatever, on the condition that he can finish his drink before her. Still having a tired look on his face, he decides to take part in her game. He then begins to down his drink, but in a flash, now finishes her drink and declared that she was done and it was her win. Deciding to keep his promise, Ichijo stays, even ordering food. Now then says that it has been a long time since they talked together like this, reminiscing about how they used to talk with each other after club activities when they were still in school. She then remembers that back when he had just joined the company, he lost the proposal documents and had a terrible expression on his face, like the world was coming to an end. She then tells him that at this moment, he has the same expression on his face. She then asks him to tell her what happened to him, saying that as his boss, she's worried about him. Ichijo hesitates for a moment but decides to tell her anyways. He then asks her if she would believe him if he told her that monsters would destroy the world in a few hours. Now then asks if he has any proof to back up his claim, which she affirms that he does. He pulls out his phone and checks the time. He then tells her that in a few minutes, there will be a thread on a live channel website, then a thread with pictures of dragons found in China. Sure enough, just as he said, a few minutes pass and suddenly there are threads with pictures of dragons found in China on the internet. Wondering, she then asks him how he knows of this and if he's an esper. He then tells her that while that is not the case, it is not too far from the actual case either, because he has been repeating the world over and over again because of a certain skill he obtained, of course referring to a skill returned from hell. He then asks now to call out the word status as he's testing something. She calls it out and suddenly a board appears in front of her. Now is reasonably terrified and jumps back, away from it. At first, she thinks she is hallucinating, but she claims that she is not that drunk yet. Ichijo then explains to her that she is not hallucinating and that what she is looking at right now is a status, invisible to everyone except her. He then further explains that he has come back to life so many times due to the abilities and the status. He then asks her if he believes her now, to which now, still shaken up by this newfound discovery, affirms. She then realizes that Ichijo is dejected because of his return from hell skill. She then asks him how many loops he has been through. Ichijo answers that this is his 15th time, much to Nao's utter shock. She then asks what happens to the people when the monsters appeared. Ichijo replies that he does not know what happens to anyone outside of their town adding that the people of this town are killed by the Minotaur. He also adds that he has never survived noon, and when now asks why that is, he tells her that at that hour, the monsters grow stronger. He adds that no matter what he tries to do, his attempts to hide from the enhanced Minotaur are futile, and that even if he goes unnoticed, they always manage to find and kill him. However, when he dies, he returns to the past, and returns to his life again just to be killed again. No matter how many times they kill him, he never dies. As he continues to talk, Panic and fear begin to build up in him while now silently listens. He continues, saying he has no idea what to do with his life. He continues to unbosom, lamenting that no matter how much he tries to escape, they always find and kill him, trapping him in a terrible, vicious cycle, and finds it useless to talk with anyone. Finally, he calms down and there is only silence. He then asks now if she understands now and that if she does, she should leave him alone because he's tired. Just as he's about to walk out of the door, now tells him that she's got it. Ichijo is confused at first, but then now enters her own episode of Bursts, 
although already drunk. She then tells him to sit back down and that she is not done talking to him yet. Slightly afraid, Ichijo sits back down, thinking to himself that drunk people are really serious. She then beckons him to come to her and without warning, suplexes him to the ground, shouting that he is a complete idiot. She then asks him if he has tried it once. Seeing that Ichijo is confused, she elaborates and says she is asking him if he has tried defeating the Minotaur before it upgrades, all while wrestling with him. Ichijo admits that he has not tried doing so because he sees no hope in doing so after that, explaining to her that another town is plagued by orcs and another by giant monsters. He explains it will all be for nothing because even if he beats the Minotaur, it will simply happen again. Laying over him, she still insists that he cannot simply give up. She then threatens to smash his face from the ground up. She then grabs Ichijo by his collar and begins to shake him violently. He finally pushes her aside, telling her to stop it. He then tells her that he has no choice but to surrender, and says that if he could, he would choose to die this very moment, claiming that death is far better than living in this world alone. Now then tells him not to say much. Ichijo looks up to see her crying. She continues, saying that he is not alone, regardless of what time of the day it is or what world he is living in, and that she will continue to stay by his side. He then tells her that he once let her die in one of his past lives, but now tells him that he does not have to worry about her and it does not matter, as long as she can have a drink with him and have a laugh at the end, then everything is fine with her. She continues, saying that if it hurts, then she will be there for him, so because of that, she should not try to die in front of her again. Ichijo then realizes that he had died so many times and had been so invested in escaping that he lost sight of the fact that he was supposed to be taken care of now. Beginning to cry profusely, Now then tells him not to say anything like that ever again. When they finally settle down, Now is embarrassed that she has made a very ugly scene. Ichijo consoles her, telling her not to be so depressed and offers her a glass of water, which she accepts. He then notices that she has a runny nose, though saying it out loud made Now embarrassed again and she calls herself ugly. At the sight of her sorry state, Ichijo bursts out laughing, telling Now that she's very serious, which she denies, claiming that she is too much of an idiot to be so serious. Finally feeling rejuvenated, Ichijo takes a large gulp of beer from his drink and tells Now that he has decided that he is going to fight against the Minotaur. Now then decides that if that is the case, then she will fight with him. However, they both unanimously agree that it will not be possible at the current level. Ichijo admitting that he would have to die a few times and now saying that she would have to say goodbye to her current self. Ichijo says that he has no idea how many times he would have to die to reach a level where he can beat the Minotaur and now assures herself that she is sure that she will be back someday. They then make promises to each other, Ichijo promising that he will save Now, and Now promising Ichijo that she will wait for him. Outside, he then steals himself for the upcoming battle, reminding himself that if he does not avoid the future or the Minotaur destroys the city, then neither he nor Now will survive, which he does not want. He further goes on that he has decided that he is tired of running away and will face this Minotaur head on and defeat it. Ichijo summons up the courage, and as he walks through the hallway, one of the dumpsters falls and rolls around suspiciously. He approaches it, wondering what kind of monster could be in it, perhaps a leprechaun. Just to be cautious, he pulls out his knife intending to kill whatever monster it turned out to be. But to his surprise, it's a girl, and she jumps out to plead for his help. This left him confused, till she explained how and why she ended up in a dumpster. She explains that she was on her way to the shelter with her mother and sister when her sister got separated from them. They both came back for her sister, but there was a monster. With this, Ichijo got the gist of the situation and let her tag along with him as long as possible even though he felt worried as he needed to get to the next level as soon as possible. He almost steps on an ivy vine but is warned by Aoi. Despite that, she gets stuck and he saves her again. She spots her backpack and goes to get it. The girl, named Aoi, heads to where her backpack is, when the cannibal plant reveals its full self. I'm guessing it's finally decided it was time to eat. In one of its vines, it had wrapped up her sister, Mia, and was most likely ready to ingest her as well. As a sister would normally do or react, she reaches out to go meet her sister, acting without thinking. Luckily, he is able to stop her from killing herself in the bit of saving her sister, because if she had charged in like that, the cannibal ivy plant would now have two preys to feast on, resulting in nobody being saved or doing the saving. He held her back, ordering Aoi to get behind him, as that position is out of the cannibal plant's range. Even if he tries to sense its surroundings with the vines, they would be out of reach. Even knowing this, it was hard to keep Aoi in check and out of range, as she kept yelling and calling out to Mia. The realist here, Ichijo, knows that if she gets in the monster's range, it's goodbye to life, and tells Aoi not to move as he charges into the plant's range to be a hero. As expected, after a few cuts, the plant gets a hold of him as well, and this causes Aoi to run in and reassure her sister that she would save her. Seeing that Aoi was now in the plant's range and would probably get all of them killed, he decides to act fast and cuts through the vines, closing in as best as possible. He lands a critical hit on the monster, causing it to die off and saving the sisters in the process. The reunion between Aoi and Mai is short-lived as something happens after they thank Ichijo. 
Out of the blue, a related monster, and most likely stronger than the previous cannibal ivy plant, takes off the heads of the sisters he had saved. This is right after he had risked his own life by putting himself in danger and slaying the cannibal plant monster. Right after he felt good for helping those in need, the sisters thank him, emphasizing that they would never forget his kindness. And the next thing that happens is, off with their heads. I guess they kept their promise, though for a short period of time. This sight makes him tremble in despair, as he just watched the humans he saved get killed in an instant and on the spot. That aside, there's still the reality that he has to face this new and improved monster that has just taken off the heads of two people in an instant and one go, even though it was sudden and unexpected. This new beast is a level 22 beast tagged Maneater. Overcoming the shock, reality hits as his next move is either to escape or evade the monster's attacks and claw while running away, or maintain the mindset he had earlier of facing monsters or powers that be. Against him, that is. Akira Ichijo stares in horror as he watches the sisters he just saved. They were so full of life a few seconds ago when they thanked him for saving them, but now they stand headless. These beasts truly have no sense of compassion. But that's enough about pity, it's every head for himself now. Akira must now decide whether to face the level 22 man-eater head on, or whether he needs to run for his life immediately. In a split second decision, after analyzing its stats, Akira concludes that there's no way he would face such a vicious beast and walk out victorious. The difference in power between the two creatures is overwhelming. As it stands, he has only one choice, to run. He attempts to run, but for some reason, his body doesn't move. Akira desperately tries to regain control over his body, but it's almost as if his body wants him to stay and fight. With the monster so close, he realizes that he must now fight for his life and his dear friend now. Akira brings out his weapon and steadies himself in anticipation of the battle. It's a good thing he was prepared, because the monster attacks first with a quick attack, trying to catch Akira off guard. Akira moves to the side and just in time. It was all he could do to avoid becoming an instant man-eater's meal. He understands that the monster's attack is a dangerous one, and that particular attack could end him in just one hit. He studies his goblin dagger, and from then on, he feels it's a question of who can land the first hit. From his analysis, Akira understands that the man-eater's offense is much stronger than its defense. It looks like the monster is not so invulnerable after all. The man-eater attacks again, this time with its substitute for hands. Akira tries to block the attack with his weapon, the goblin's dagger, but the weapon breaks in two, much to Akira's shock. Akira can decide to flee from the battle while he still can, but he's far too invested in the fight. He decides to attack with his fists, jumping to the sky to get the aerial advantage. Akira attacks with as much force as possible, and lands a punch directly on the man-eater's face. The monster's face splits into two, and for a split second, it feels like Akira has his much-needed victory. But his joy is short-lived as the monster comes back together, leaving Akira utterly devastated. Akira is too shocked to move, and he realizes that there's almost nothing he can do to win against the Maneater. Reality hits him in the face in the form of a sucker punch from the Maneater, sending him flying back through a considerable distance. Akira is tired and badly injured. He looks around and sees people lying dead and injured on the streets. His train of thought leads him back to the little girls that are now headless, and back to his dear friend now. He realizes that he lives in a very cruel world, but instead of giving up, he's more determined to protect the ones he loves. Akira Ichijo folds his hands as if to say, I'm not throwing in the towel just yet. He summons all the strength left in his body, lifts a truck, and throws it directly at the man-eater. If this doesn't work, then our reincarnating hero might have to go through death again. The truck hits the monster, and it's surprisingly effective. As it turns out, the man-eater is a vegetable monster and is very weak against fire. The explosion from the truck burns the monster out, making it massively reduced in size while it's still burning. The small monster isn't a problem for Akira, as he uses his fist to finish up the vegetable amidst the flames. Well, that one was satisfying. Akira is notified of a level up, which surely means that he's defeated the monster. He also has 20 points to distribute now, and he also acquires physical enhancement as a passive skill. A little while has passed since Akira Ichijo bravely decided to fight the man-beast. Just like the effect of a baby's first steps, his victory over the monster massively boosts his confidence, making him nearly fearless while facing the medium-level monsters. Right now, Akira stands at the top of a very tall building, waiting to complete his next task by fighting the monster that shows up. The monster is a medium level one with horns and a hard shell. Thankfully, its hard shell doesn't mean it's a tough nut to crack. Akira gets to work and easily makes light work of this monster with his fists, punching so hard that it doesn't have a shell to begin with anymore. Well, that was a good warm up. He comes down from the building and assesses his stats. He's leveled up a lot since the last time. It's not just through fighting monsters, he's also died and come back three times since then. Right now, Akira has gone up to level 25 and accumulated 10 extra points. One place where Akira feels he must improve quickly is his physical strengthening skills, which would increase his strength, endurance, and skills. Akira feels that he would be able to defeat the Minotaur if he had skills up to that level. However, it's easier said than done. 
All his work so far has surely made him level up, but it's not just as quickly as one would expect. He also needs to gain more points to upgrade his skills, and the easiest way to get points is by completing quests and getting rewards. This would sound so much better if those quests didn't involve battles against Minotaurs, which he's not strong enough to defeat yet. So it's like an endless loop, and I'm not even referring to his continuous death and revival. Other than the Minotaur though, Akira feels like he has leveled up enough to become stronger than every monster in the city. While still contemplating his next line of action, Akira's eyes spot something on the system just as he searches for good skills. Magic Circuit, which costs 5 points to acquire the level 1 skill. Magic Circuit is a passive ability. With this ability, even creatures with no aptitude for magic power become suitable for magic power. Depending on the size of the circuit created in the body, the suitability for magic power increases, and the size of the skill circuit depends on the skill level. After analyzing this new ability, Akira concludes that it could be a very valuable skill. And it's not just that, he feels like he has found a way to defeat the Minotaur with the skill, without needing to get to level 30. His theory is simple, he just needs to level up by fighting the regular medium level monsters, so that he can increase the value of his magic power. With his potential new level in magic circuit, Akira feels he stands a much better chance at taking down the Minotaur. And so, he begins his self-given quest. Monster after monster, he keeps fighting every monster that could possibly help him level up, with the end goal being the death battle with the Minotaur. Of course, he's also engaged in death battles with these ones, but they are just small fries compared to the Minotaur. He gets his first kill, second kill, third. Akira kills these monsters, using now as his motivations for survival and leveling up. He receives a Bronze Hunter trophy from the system. Finally, he upgrades from level 25 to 30. Akira wakes up in his office after his latest death. It takes him time to get used to the surroundings after his revival, so he doesn't hear his boss, now constantly calling his name. Now yells at Akira for ignoring her, and then she moves to pull off her usual move of pinning Akira to the ground. No matter how hard she tries, it's like Akira is suddenly immovable. Now, with no idea of what's going on, expresses her surprise of how strong Akira Ichijo has gotten. Akira holds her hands and thanks her, much to her surprise. He thanks Nao for being a good friend and motivating him. According to Akira, it's only thanks to Nao's word that he could fight to the best of his ability. Again, Nao is completely clueless about what Akira means. Akira tells his boss that he would like her to tell him something when it's all over. But for now, he pleads with Nao to stay put and never leave the office, no matter what happens on the outside. Nao attempts to make Akira explain everything, but he's already on his way out. All she can do is stare in confusion. They say ignorance is bliss, but this certainly doesn't feel blissful at the moment. Akira leaves the building and walks onto the street. He's had an extended period of training, working hard and waiting for this opportunity. Now, Akira must come at the Minotaur with everything he has, including his new skill, the Magic Circuit. The street is still full of life at the moment, and the monsters are yet to show up. If only these people knew what would happen in a little while. He walks down to the point where it all started for him, where he first encountered the Minotaur. The moment he gets there, a system notification pops up that requires him to search for the Class C Minotaur and face him. Akira just steadies himself, which could be because he knows that the monster would find him, and soon enough, the gigantic, ruthless monster shows up right in front of him. This doesn't feel like the old times when Akira lost his courage and tried to make a run for it. Now, Akira feels very prepared to take his long-awaited revenge on the Minotaur. Even though Akira doesn't lose his courage, the sheer physical presence of this monster would be enough to send the bravest of men running. Akira feels a tingling, cold sensation down his spine. A little bit of fear isn't so bad, I guess. After facing the monster so many times, Akira knows a lot about its strength and attack patterns, so he makes the first move. Running towards the Minotaur at full speed, Akira lets the monster's face feel his fist for a change. This sends the Minotaur back a couple of steps. It looks like he's just getting warmed up. Thankfully, it's the same for Akira. In a couple of minutes, Akira is all over the Minotaur, landing blows from everywhere. The monster falls but rises immediately. A smirk from the monster shows that it has barely felt the effect of any of Akira's moves. Our fighter might be in for a long night. The rest of the city is now in a state of utter confusion. Everyone starts to run helter-skelter, scampering for safety as quickly as they can. The noise from the commotion travels as far as Akira's office, where his boss now hears it. She rushes to one of the corridors in the building, where she can get a good view of the city. She remembers Akira's stern warning not to leave the building no matter what happens. Thankfully, she heeds the warning and doesn't go outside, at least not yet. Now wonders whether Akira's final warning has anything to do with the city's current situation, and she wonders whether something terrible has happened to her friend and employee, Akira. She would probably have gone out to check, but Akira's words ring in her head and make her stay put. Meanwhile, Akira Ichijo and the Minotaur are now heavily locked in battle. After letting Akira flex around a little, the huge creature roars loudly, its completely white eyes as bright as the streetlights. It picks up the giant axe-like weapon that matches its size and then runs towards Akira, 
with the ground beneath barely able to support its weight. The Minotaur looks like a creature with only one thing in mind, to kill. Even though Akira has fought with the monstrous creature more than just a few times and can predict his battle patterns to a large extent, it doesn't mean that Akira is completely resistant to the Minotaur's attacks. Whenever the Minotaur is on the offensive, it always seems to have the upper hand on Akira. And what's more is that Akira's attacks don't seem to do more damage than just a few scratches here and there. The Minotaur attacks Akira with its axe-like blade. Akira barely dodges the swing of the blade, but the monster is so quick that Akira doesn't notice the follow-up of its hands until it's too late. Akira takes a punch to the face and is forcefully sent more than a few meters backward, his back crashing against the wall of a building. The monster, according to Akira's analysis, has a strength point value of 190. In comparison, Akira's endurance points stands at just 76. It's what is normally expected when a level 45 monster and a level 30 human go head-on in battle. Akira knows that if he takes a direct hit from the monster, it could be the end of him. The Minotaur is fast approaching and Akira must do something to avoid being Minotaur meat. Thankfully, he has one more trick up his sleeves, Magic Circuit. He uses the skill to suddenly increase his sprint power, giving him much more speed than he previously had, currently at level 1 for Akira and fixed at 10 times that value. Currently, the power consumed for skill usage is 1. Activating Sprint means that Akira can dodge the Minotaur's incoming attack and avoid a direct hit. He also tries to get a couple of hits on the monster, but since he's not used to the speed, he doesn't measure the required force properly and ends up getting a minimal hit and almost losing balance. However, Akira manages to spot something. It looks like the blow he landed with Sprint did some damage to the Minotaur. Akira decides to go for it again, this time using the right amount of force and focusing on just one point. Akira is also wary that he can only sustain the skill for a short period of time. Right now, the sprint skill can't last more than 60 seconds, meaning that he has just one minute to end this battle. The Minotaur comes at him again, but this time, it doesn't seem to be as quick as it was. It looks like his sprint didn't just match the monster's speed, it also surpassed it. Magical circuit skill must be a real shocker to the Minotaur. Akira goes directly at the beast with his fist, landing a simple yet effective punch on the beast's upper body. The Minotaur doesn't look like he's fine, yet he gets up like nothing happened and continues to attack Akira. At this stage, the battle becomes a real visual spectacle for the neutral viewers, except that most of the viewers are running from monsters in the streets. The battle has gone on for a little while now, and using his sprint skill, Akira has landed more than a few blows that could ordinarily put the match to bed. However, the Minotaur manages to get up and launch another attack after every hit. Is this thing indestructible? Akira has to think of a way to end the battle, because in a few seconds, his skill time will run out, and that would inevitably spell out not just his doom, but also now's and everyone in the city. Akira thinks he's finally gotten it. If this doesn't work, he doesn't know what else would. After managing to get the upper hand on the beast in fist combat, he pushes him through a wall of a high floor of the building where the fight has led them. As the Minotaur falls from above, Akira follows it, with his fist accompanying him. It's been a tough battle, but Akira knows that it's now time to end everything. This must be satisfying for him as he thinks about all the times he got killed by this and other monsters. He thinks about the girls he saved that were immediately killed by the man-beast. He remembers how his normal life was taken from him by the fallen beast. Brimming with a mixture of anger and confidence, Akira declares that the battle is over, and then calls out the skill he intends to end the battle with, Steel Beams. With his fists of steel, he uses all his might to land a punch on the Minotaur, making sure his fist follows the creature all the way to the ground. The punch breaks the ground and nearly destroys the entire street. A mixture of light, wood, rocks, and dust scatters all around, making sure that the result of the skill isn't known for a while. After Ichijo waits nervously for the Minotaur to show up again, the beast fails to show up. As he's waited for a while and the dust seems like it has settled, Akira becomes increasingly confident that he's finally won the battle. His confidence evolves into happiness as he celebrates his latest victory. Akira begins to make plans for his next line of action. He feels too exhausted from the battle and intends to lie there for a while. After he wakes up, he plans to visit now. But then, Akira remembers that he has yet to receive a quest completion notification from the system. Could it be what he's thinking? The ground below him starts to rumble and Akira's happiness turns to despair, as the Minotaur forcefully appears from the ruins. All his skills manage to do is just slow the monster down for a while. Even with the hole from the punch right in the middle of its chest, the Minotaur is still alive and fine. He's not just fine, he looks even angrier than before. The Minotaur roars and then approaches its opponent at full speed. What can Akira do against this horrifying monster? Its loud roar reaching the ears of bystanders nearby. These onlookers witness something plummeting from the sky, crashing forcefully into the hard concrete ground. Shocked, some of them contemplate that it might be a bomb. After the dust settles, they see that the earlier crash wasn't a bomb but a human. Confusion and disbelief filled the air. 
Akira lies on the ground, immobile, observing innocent bystanders attempting to call for help. A concerned woman rushes over, inquiring about his well-being, but he is unable to speak properly. He's unsure if he's alive or deceased, devoid of sensation. Despite his efforts to warn her, the lady struggles to comprehend his message. Suddenly, the Minotaur charges in, wreaking havoc by demolishing buildings along its path. He's burdened by an overwhelming sense of impossibility when it comes to conquering the Minotaur. This challenge has trailed him from the distant past, creating an unshakable belief that when the stakes are highest, he consistently finds himself falling short. And this notion might indeed carry some weight. Across countless previous lifetimes, the individuals he manages to rescue always invariably meet a grim fate. It's this weighty realization that leaves Akira with an inescapable conviction that shielding or rescuing others remains frustratingly out of his grasp. After the Minotaur completes its brutal spree, indiscriminately claiming the lives of those around, it eventually shifts its attention towards Akira. In a slow and deliberate approach, just as it begins closing in, an unexpected turn of events unfolds. A solid stone takes a precise trajectory, striking the beast's eyes with uncanny accuracy. Fueled by anger, it starts looking around everywhere for the one responsible. It soon finds Nao, who's visibly shaky but brave, holding a strong metal pipe. She tells the creature to pay attention to her, not Akira, as she steps up to challenge it. Akira is left surprised and puzzled by her presence. After a moment, he gathers courage and urgently calls out to her to stop. He's confused why she's there, especially since he warned her to stay safe in the office. As he begs her to run away, she tells him that a real leader takes care of their team, making her point clear. The Minotaur focuses on Nao, moving slowly ahead to grab her head with its big paws, planning to hurt her badly. Suddenly, Akira gets a clear idea. He's tired of living without a purpose, not being able to protect someone from danger. This time, he's determined to shield Nao from the Minotaur. Gathering strength from his love for her, he uses the sprint skill again. With strong resolve, Akira ignores caution, taking a brave risk. His determination pushes him forward as he charges at the Minotaur, ready to defeat it with one strong strike. As Akira runs, he notices that he is finding it difficult to breathe, and his body is feeling like it's burning with intense heat. He knows he has surpassed his body's limit, but he also knows that he is not dead and he is alive, which means he is going to keep on fighting and he will not let Nao die. He has just one second left, one second to change his story, to change how he has perceived himself, to finally save someone important to him. In that one second, he has a flashback of a conversation between him and Nao from a time when she asked him if he was sick and if there was something bothering him so that they could just talk about it. He also recalls the heartfelt promise he made to save her, the words she shared about waiting for him. This memory ignited an intense surge of determination within Akira. Summoning every ounce of strength, he instinctively seizes the Minotaur's abandoned axe that was lying on the ground. As the final milliseconds tick away, he's not only able to reach the Minotaur, but with astonishing precision. He is also able to deliver a decisive blow that cleaves the creature in two, a stunning and dramatic feat. The Minotaur crumples to the ground, lifeless. Onlookers among the crowd stand in stunned silence, utterly bewildered by the abrupt turn of events. Their minds struggle to grasp the gravity of what just happened in that fleeting split-second instance. With the Minotaur defeated, a surge of relief sweeps over them. The notification board pops up, notifying Akira that the C-ranked quest, Minotaur, has been cleared. Instantly, a wave of newfound power begins to course throughout his entire body. His accomplishment earns him 50 points as a reward, a silver trophy, and all its accompanying advantages. Furthermore, his level leaps from 30 to 38 in an instant. Akira is finally able to breathe a sigh of relief finally knowing that he has defeated his long-standing nemesis. Now approaches him slowly and gives him an emotional, heartfelt embrace. Tears stream down her face as she clings to him, her voice trembling as she asks how he managed to end up like that. Overwhelmed by exhaustion, Akira's body sinks to the ground, finding comfort as Now gently cradles his head in her lap. In a soft voice, he expresses his desire to confide in her and talk to her about everything that has happened to him so far. However, he suggests that, before delving into his tale, they should go have a drink together. Just then, Akira's attention is drawn to an extra notification, which informs him of his triumphant conquest over challenges that had left an indelible mark on his soul. Furthermore, the message informs him that his unique skill, Back From Hell, will now be enhanced with an additional effect. This augmentation is a direct result of the newfound abilities associated with resurrection, and as a result of these newfound enhancements, Akira gains access to two additional system functions, Inventory and Scenario. Down a lonely street, two boys sprint frantically, desperately seeking a place to hide from the monsters chasing them. Amid their dash, they clutch their phones, listening to the latest news about how the monster's invasion has plunged governments worldwide into disarray, with the death toll already exceeding 3 million in their country alone. After a while, they finally find a place to hide and rest. Amidst panting breaths, one boy inquires about his companion's level and learns that he's at level 7. 
The latter then curiously asks the former about his level. When the other boy discloses his level 6 status, he also adds that he wonders if they can both survive the situation. The other one says they could both survive if only they could have Bullman as an ally. Intrigued yet unaware, the former asks about the identity of the said Bullman. Astonished at his friend's ignorance, the latter shows him a video of Akira during the period when he defeated the Minotaur. He explains to his friend that the person who defeated the Minotaur was popularly known by those who witnessed it as the Bullman, and he also believes that the Bullman is still in the city. Somewhere in the city, now is taking good care of Akira at the hospital. She's by his bedside, carefully peeling an apple. With a kind smile, she asks if he wants some. He appreciates her offer but says she should enjoy it. Now mentions how apples are rare now, but she doesn't want him to force himself to eat. She reassures him he can have it when he feels up to it. Akira remembers that after the fight with the Minotaur, he was stuck in bed for two days due to the battle's toll. Now earlier explained that the hospital is protected by defense forces, and they had Wi-Fi access on the first day. Big thanks to the netizens who noticed how everyone seems to have levels and stats now. People are starting to assume life's like a video game, even with everything that went down. In the midst of this, Akira becomes interested in Nao's level. However, as he tries to ask her, he finds her already sleeping soundly. He calls out to her and she responds with an apology, explaining that she was spaced out. Concerned, he asks her if she's feeling okay, and suggests that she rest for a bit. She insists she's fine and wide awake, yet ironically, she immediately succumbs to sleep, her head resting on the bed. Akira initiates the progress rate display, and a board pops up showing that the progression rate is now 2.66%. After thinking about it for a while, Akira deduces that two days have gone by and the rate is still 2.66%. Remembering what now said about the rate going up by 1% each night, and before it used to go up by 1% in half a day, he realizes that the progression rate is now getting slower. Akira deduces that the reason it's slowing down is probably due to the decrease in progression displayed after defeating the Minotaur, which only means that if they don't defeat boss monsters, the world inversion rate will increase and the monsters will get stronger to the point where no one would stand a chance. Akira knows that someone has to take the lead and defeat the boss, but with what has happened so far, he's the only one who can take it. However, Akira knows that he defeated the Minotaur because he only wanted to save and protect now and that he's no hero. Neither does he intend to become one because just being able to protect her is enough for him. Much to Akira's surprise, now rises from her seat, effortlessly maneuvering into the sickbed to rest comfortably by Akira's side. A rush of shock and embarrassment courses through Akira's thoughts, and he begins to wonder if now is perhaps beginning to have affectionate feelings towards him. Tentatively, he calls out her name, only to realize she's just half asleep. Opting to set aside the issue for now, Akira prioritizes addressing what he is going to do with his battered body. Consulting the status board, he assesses his overall stats. He discovers that all of his stats have increased tremendously. At last, his attention falls upon the newly emerged inventory and scenario icons, and he remembers that these icons appeared right after he defeated the Minotaur. Intrigued, he taps on the inventory icon, and it opens up an empty interface. His memory serves him. Much like in mobile games, an inventory denotes a space for stashing items, a reservoir of possessions awaiting purpose. Curious about the inventory's functionality, Akira embarks on a test promptly adding his smartphone to the inventory. As he gazes at his hand, he notices that his smartphone still rests within his grip. Knowing this, he decides to delete smartphone from the inventory, after realizing that the inventory did nothing to affect his smartphone. He later clicks on scenario only to get a notification that the scenario is not currently activated. He gets even more confused about the fact that it is not activated, and realizes that it means that he can't use it either. He decides to forget everything and deal with it later. Contemplating his options, he begins to wonder if he should use the accumulated points he has been waiting for to acquire some skills. He opens his skill tab and is shocked to find out that the value of his magic power is decreasing. Originally, it was leveled at 14. Now, it has dropped down to 13. He then wonders if the magic power used for the sprint skill didn't recover. He continues to wonder if that only means that the magic power value itself becomes the usage limit. Given the circumstances, Akira recognizes the pressing need to focus on enhancing his magic power recovery skill. After careful consideration, he definitively selects not only magic power recovery, but also auto regeneration, physical enhancement, and sixth sense skills. Intrigued, he decided to gauge the duration required for the magic power recovery skill to replenish his magic energy, since it really is essential to confirm that information. Magic power recovery skill is the time required for magic power restoration, responding to the elapsed time. The time varies based on the skill level. He checks out the necessary information about the auto-generation skill and realizes that it gradually restores health over time. At that moment, the pain all over his body begins to subside, and he believes that it seems to be working well. Akira also increases his physical enhancement skill, which cost him 30 points. He notices that level 3 increases his physical stat by 50. Akira believes that with all these newly acquired skills at his disposal, he should be able to fight even against strengthened monsters. 
He finally checks out the sixth sense skill and deduces that it enhances intuition or instinctual prowess. And also, it seems like it will be useful for making quick decisions during emergencies. But then Akira still believes that acquiring it for 12 points is still quite a lot. Sixth Sense is a passive skill that allows the skill holder to gain sensory abilities beyond the five senses. Additionally, they become capable of discerning the essence of things that cannot be perceived through the five senses, and the strength of the skill holder's sixth sense depends on the skill level. After Akira is done ranking up his physical stats, he realizes that he has only two points left, and then he contemplates whether he should invest the points into magic power to enhance the power of sprint. He finally invests the two points, and surprisingly, his sprint skill usage increased from 13 to 19. Akira realizes that it seems that some skills don't increase by one point for each level, and in other words, it's possible to create a build according to one's own preferences, which means he'll try his best to become a brute force build. After feeling satisfied with strengthening himself, Akira decides to rest and focus on recovery until he's ready to move again. After some time, Nowster's awake, her surprise evident as she realizes she's on his bed. With a gentle tone, Akira explains to her that she was only half asleep. Noticing that she was still on the bed, he curiously asks her why she hasn't moved from her position on top of him. Unexpectedly, Now's cheeks flush with color, and in a romantic tone, she playfully asks what he'd do if she tells him she doesn't want to get up. Caught off guard by her words, Akira feels his own cheeks warm as he begins to get flustered too. Now takes a bold step, inching her lips closer to his, a clear sign of her intent to kiss him, her actions brimming with unspoken emotion. Right as Now is about to kiss Akira, the room door suddenly opens, interrupting their private moment. A soldier enters without knocking, introducing himself as Lieutenant Colonel Karube from the Ground Self-Defense Force. He came in a hurry upon hearing that Akira Ichijo woke up. As he speaks, he sees Akira in an awkward position with now on top of him, feeling embarrassed by the sight. Karube suggests they continue and take their time, but they stop him, explaining the misunderstanding. He agrees to wait a bit longer. Once now is properly seated, the lieutenant introduces himself again as Miroru Karube, part of the forces guarding the hospital for monsters. He thanks Akira for defeating the Minotaur and saving the city. He emphasizes that Akira's actions have greatly impacted everyone and declares him as humanity's beacon of hope. Right when he's about to request a favor from Akira, another soldier enters suddenly. The soldier questions whether Akira is truly the one who defeated the Minotaur. He stares at Akira closely and thinks he looks too weak to have beaten the Minotaur. The soldier even calls Akira ragged and implies he won't be useful for a while. This soldier named Makimoto gets interrupted by Karube, who asks why he's in the room. Makimoto explains he wanted to see what kind of person Akira is, but he's disappointed now. Then he notices Nao and comments that she's his type. He tries to flirt with Nao, acting disrespectful and claiming her as his own, which makes her very disgusted. The soldier keeps talking to Akira, saying that because of the inversion rate, monsters are now much stronger. He doesn't think Akira, who looks a bit scruffy, can defend himself, and calls Akira beating the boss a lucky accident. He brags more, saying his level is 25 and he's the best in the hospital. Then he takes Nao's arm and wants her to go to his room with him. Akira quickly grabs the man's hand really tight. He politely asks the soldier to release Nao because she's scared. The man gets mad and tries to punch Akira. Instead, Akira's grip gets stronger, causing a small fracture in the man's wrist. The man screams in pain, surprised by Akira's unexpected strength, especially since Akira is only level 9 but has super high stats. Realizing he's outmatched, the man's eyes well up with tears and he starts to sweat a lot. Akira lets go, apologizing for gripping too hard and not knowing his strength. Karube tells the man to leave the room, and he quickly runs out. Karube apologizes about Makimoto's behavior, and returns to the earlier subject he wanted to talk about. He tells Akira that some people have seen a boss monster near the hospital. If that monster attacks, they won't have a good chance against it. Then he pleads for Akira to defeat the boss on their behalf, but now tries to say no for Akira, explaining how he suffered battling the Minotaur and hasn't fully recovered. But Karube insists, admitting that he has no alternative, Karobe opens up to Akira, acknowledging his impressive abilities despite his low level. He refrains from prying into the source of Akira's strength, but earnestly requests his help. After a brief pause, Akira agrees. Karobe expresses gratitude and heartfelt appreciation to Akira for his decision. Once Karobe leaves, Akira opens up to Nao about his past ordeals. Nao becomes sadder, learning that despite his tough experiences, he's determined to face another monster upon waking up. She wonders why he can't take a break. With a chuckle, he admits he had given up on fighting, but Nao's presence showed him he's not alone, and gave him courage to confront the Minotaur again. He declares his intent to protect those he cares for, assuring Nao he'll defeat the boss and asks her not to worry. She says they can leave, but only if they both face the boss together. He tries to object, but she pleads and explains she wants to fight by his side. She insists he shouldn't challenge the boss alone. She keeps asking to come along. And suddenly, a scenario status board appears, letting Akira know that certain requirements are fulfilled and the scenario is ready to begin. It provides more details about the scenario with Now. 
Also, it tells him he doesn't have to take part if he doesn't want to. He can decide whether to go along with this or not. His ability resurrection will keep helping now during this time, but after the situation, now won't have that power anymore. Ichijo is surprised to hear about this scenario. Why now of all possible times? Now sees the confusion and worry written all over his face and asks him why the change of mood. He tells her the truth, although waving it as something she shouldn't really be bothered about. He tells her he can see a screen saying the scenario that can be activated has appeared. She expresses she has no idea what a scenario is. He explains to her and she tries to get things clear. She soon understands that the scenario appeared because she had offered to be a helping hand to Ichijo. It's basically so, but he's not entirely sure if it's certain. Technically now, if she dies alongside him, they'll both come back to life. To her, it's not so bad a thing, but rather convenient for going back to defeat the boss monster. Since she's put the proposal that way, Ichijo asks her to please accept the scenario. Deep down, he knows the resurrection skill is more hell than power. There are moments you can't die even if you wanted to. He's bold enough to lay a plane so now knows exactly what she's getting herself into, and she expresses that she understands. She decides her mind is made up no matter what Ichijo tries to say and put her off. In her own words, her resolve won't waver anymore. He's not surprised. She's never been the type to listen to alternatives once her mind is made up about something. He tells himself he can't let now experience the pain that comes with resurrection, so he'd rather do all he can so she doesn't die in the first place. Now remains pumped up about what is to come, stating she understands fully what is currently at stake and so she will accept the scenario. The screen prompts the scenario of Nanase and Ichijo about to begin and from now on, now will respond to Ichijo's quests. The condition for clearing the scenario is to defeat the boss monster together with Nanase now. Ichijo starts to strategize. If now is going to work with him, then it's better they start sharing stats, skills, and other information, and now agrees. Ichijo leads the way by showing his, and now takes note of his many skills, concluding that's why he's so strong. She decides it's her turn to return the favor, but Ichijo tells her there's no need for that. He can confirm what he needs to with his current analysis level. She's currently at level 16 and has acquired 0 points. Her stamina, strength, endurance, and speed are at levels 18, 29, 27, and 28 respectively. As he continues his analyses, she pushes him away, insecure that he has that much access to her without her permission. Ichijo tells her to calm down. It's just a status information that anyone could see if they also had his current analysis level. She insists that the information is private data regardless, and that could include bits on weight and height. So she's definitely not cool with him peeking at her information without her consent. He expresses he had no idea there was a section for measurements, and if there were, he hasn't looked into it. She responds that she knows he can't really help peeking, but he still needs to be cautious so he doesn't get into trouble by peeking into the wrong one, especially now that he's been tagged the bull man. She takes out her phone and shows the videos trending on social network services from the night he killed the Minotaur. In the video, he's captured looking straight at the camera, hence the name he's been tagged. He apologizes once again for using his analysis skill on her, but expresses he's not a fan of the nickname. Now disagrees. She thinks the nickname is cute. Ichijo asks now about the skills she has, and she tells him she has physical enhancement, magic circuit, and beginner magic. Skill holders can learn beginner magic. The damage of the beginner magic varies depending on the magic power value. The number of beginner magic spells learned depends on the skill level. Impressive. Ichijo is thrilled that she will be of more use to him than he initially expected. She clarifies it's not really her style, but she's looking forward to trying magic. Ichijo's mesmerized face prompts her to ask what's making him all happy, and he asks if the consumption of magic power decreases when she casts spells. And the answer is no. But the more she casts spells, the more her body heats up, making her gradually tired. In essence, beginner magic depletes physical stamina. It makes their strategy take better form. During battles, he'll play the lead while she supports. Now states is fine by her as long as he's sure that he's healed enough. He tells her he's going through the stage of auto-generation, so he's gradually getting better and should be up and at him during the next day. Now decides to give him his space so he can rest, asking that he take it easy. Meanwhile, the current world inversion rate is at 3.01%. Outside Ichijo's hospital room, now runs into Minoru Karube, who is on patrol for monsters who are nocturnal in nature. He inquires about Ichijo's health, and now assures that he'll be ready by tomorrow. While conversing, now hears a strange noise that has her on alert. Clueless Ichijo is still in his room, affirming that he can defeat the boss monster with now by his side. The screen prompts a message that now has died, and her resurrection skill is activating. It's beyond shocking. It was only minutes ago that she stepped out. What happened to her? Ichijo wakes up in a hospital bed with an oxygen mask on. The last thing he remembers is the screen showing that now died. And then he must have died too, right? But it's also strange because he hasn't returned to the office scene, the starting point of each resurrection. Now he wonders if the starting point of the resurrection has been altered. What's also strange is the timing. He wonders if things have generally changed because he has previously defeated the Minotaur monster. 
Then the realization hit him. He let Nao die. That shouldn't have happened under any circumstances. The door opens and in steps Nao herself, calling out his name. He grabs her and immediately expresses his relief at seeing her alive. She explains that she did indeed die, recalling when she went out for some fresh air and ran into Karobe. They talked for a while and then a monster sprung out of nowhere and attacked her. He asks her if he knows which monster attacked her and she replies that she doesn't know. All she remembers is that it was an enormous black creature. After that, she was revived back to the time frame where Ichijo first woke up by the front entrance. The monster kills her and it reset time, affecting Ichijo. If that's the case, Ichijo sees the situation as troublesome. The monster will come back for her sometime later that night. Now apologizes for the inconvenience she must have caused Ichijo. Ichijo tells her there's nothing to apologize for. Things would have altered sooner or later, changing the starting point of resurrection. They don't really understand why the starting point changed, but they decide to prioritize preparing to defeat monsters. Now agrees and announces she'll let Karobe and the rest know. Ichijo begins to slowly understand that the scenario now accepted is more problematic than they expected. If one of them dies, they both die and have to restart, and what's worse is that they'll restart in the hospital, currently their most vulnerable option with Ichijo recuperating all over again. He wonders if he'll be able to protect now this way. He decides he has to put his negative thoughts away and do what he needs to do. Make sure now doesn't repeat the painful process of resurrection. Now asks about his physical condition, and although he's still covered in a lot of bandages, he states he's improved in health by a milestone. He believes he would have recovered more by the time the monsters came to attack. He decides to take a walk to hasten up his recovery and asks now to wait for him. He starts walking down the hospital's hallway and at some point gets lost. He approaches the elevator and reasons it's most likely not functioning. Big hospitals are a bit tricky to navigate, but he still has some time before the monsters invade, so he tries to memorize as many routes as he can. As he does so, he hears a strange sound that has other patients coming out of their rooms to know where the noise is coming from. It was an alarm that was set off, signifying the monsters have invaded. A man runs into the hallway clarifying this and pleading that anyone who can fend them off should please help. Ichijo asks the man where these monsters currently are and he responds they were at the main entrance of the building. One minute it was peaceful and the next, the entrance was surrounded by black wolves. The self-defense force personnel are doing the best they can, but the monsters came in a large number, easily overwhelming them. It leaves Ichijo wondering if the black wolves were the same monsters that attacked and killed now. Ichijo thanks the informant and races down the stairs utterly confused. The monsters weren't supposed to attack until a few hours later. Could informing Karube and the others on defense have altered things yet again? At the entrance, the defense team are using shields to try and hold back the monsters. Karube urges his team to put their back into it and hold their ground even when a soldier cries, they can't do it for much longer. Eventually, the barricades are broken and the monsters begin to ruthlessly attack the soldiers. Karube tries his best to lead, attacking back and urging his troops into formation, as this is a crucial moment they can't give up on. The wolves kill off many of the soldiers, but Karube decides he won't let the monsters into the building. Even if he can't kill them off, he hopes to buy enough time for survivors to escape. Just when Karube thinks it's game over, Ichijo comes to the rescue. With a single kick, he sends a pack of the wolves flying off. He apologizes to Karube that he wasn't here much earlier, but now that he is, he'll take care of the rest. Karube marvels at Ichijo's strength and calls him the boss. He's just in time to face the three-headed wolf monster. Now runs through the hospital hallways until she's at the main entrance where she finds Karube and some other soldiers. She notices he's been badly injured and asks if he's fine. He warns her not to go beyond the entrance as it could be dangerous. Furthermore, Ichijo is currently dealing with the three-headed beast. The soldiers watch Ichijo seamlessly attack the monster and one of them notes he's rather fierce and incredible. The other soldier feels like he'll be done for any moment. And then in a blink of an eye, it looks like Ichijo has been defeated. The monster slams Ichijo into the ground and charges for the rest of them. Ichijo lifts the monster up with a single hand. He notices his endurance is incredible and raising his physical enhancement has made a huge difference. Now the next thing for him to try is muscle strength. The soldier notices how he blocks the monster's attack with just one hand and marvels at it. Ichijo decides he has personal beef with the monster. It's the same one that killed now, so it's its turn to die. Ichijo lands a deadly blow, killing the beast. The soldiers chant that he can do it again. He has to finish off the other beasts. Now silently watches as Ichijo faces off the rest. His hand is hurt and bleeding, but he remains bold. Then he notices something different about the other monsters. They're a different cult and there seems to be a terrifying sense of pressure on their skin just like that of the Minotaur. It makes him realize the three-headed wolf he previously defeated wasn't the boss but a mere subordinate. The three other wolves he's about to face are also subordinates and somewhere out there is the main boss sending and commanding these other beasts. It makes him realize that things are much tougher than they expect. If the boss monster shows up, they don't stand a chance especially in their wounded state. 
Ichijo gets confused about his next line of action, and then they all hear a sound that has the wolves running off and the soldiers wondering. Ichijo wonders if the sound they heard was from the boss monster commanding the subordinates to retreat. It could mean they'll regroup and get stronger, strong enough to kill off the survivors. In the recent battle, they've lost 7 self-defense members and have less than half members left who aren't badly wounded, leaving just a rough number of 18 able-bodied soldiers. Ichijo tries to think of a strategy quickly to fend off the monsters. His only relief is despite the increase in their inversion rate, their strength is still roughly the same. They don't get stronger even with an increase in their percentage. While in the middle of his deep analysis, Nao steps up and apologizes that she couldn't be of much help to him. She asks if the monster defeated was the boss monster, and Ichijo tells her no. It was only a subordinate. Nao asks why they attacked so quickly, and Ichijo suggests that it is perhaps because they had been commanded to attack the hospital building from the onset. He further suggests that they're better off following the same actions as the last time, and change the enemy's movements too much. Now inquires about Ichijo's hurt fist, and he states his auto-generating skills are taking care of it. He, however, can't keep on relying on punches to get the job done, and would need strong weapons to assist him. Now and Ichijo notice a hooded person by the monster's corpse with a knife in their hand. On closer look, they see the person is dismembering the monster's body to collect monster materials. These monster materials are then used for crafting weapons. Ichijo gets even closer and asks the person for the identity, thinking it's someone called Kashiwaba. The person removes their hood, revealing a child which drives Ichijo to shock and disbelief. The child recognizes Ichijo as Bullman and asks if she can help him with anything. Ichijo points out that she's gathering materials and would love it if she could make a weapon for him. After much thought, she agrees, but admits she hasn't acquired the crafting skill yet. She feels it's rather strange he doesn't have a weapon, as he's supposed to defeat the Minotaur. He should have a hand axe. Ichijo resonates with the idea. With a hand axe, he would be able to fight effortlessly against the Minotaur. The child states she knows where the weapon he seeks is located, and its stats are incredibly high. Ichijo didn't know the weapon had stats, and the child reassured him that weapons also have attributes. She offers to tell him all about it. We left off at the status of the Minotaur Axe. Apparently, if he uses his evaluation skill, he can look up the numerical value of any weapon. For example, the SDF man's gun has a value of plus 2. He asks what then is the value of the hand axe, and Kashiwaba replies she has some information, but it's not a max evaluation of the item. The Bull Axe, recommended strength value of 80 or above. Ichijo also takes note that the attack power of the weapon is at 75, and wonders if that adds to his own attack power of 165. If so, then it's a pretty strong addition. The equipment's effect is unavailable, but Ichijo decides that overall, the weapon is worth picking up. He then thanks Kashiwaba for her help, and she waves it off, stating it was no biggie. He asks for her help to evaluate more weapons if she gets her hands on them. She reminds him that she doesn't have evaluation skills. Whatever knowledge she has, she got by coincidence. She learned about the SDF gun from a soldier who is now dead. She states she's planning to acquire production skills at some point, and when she does, she'll gladly offer her knowledge to Ichijo, but for a discounted price. Ichijo is surprised that she's taking any money at all. All the same, Ichijo is happy to have Kashiwaba in his corner. Now draws Ichijo's attention back to her, and he uses the opportunity to tell her he's on a mission to get the Minotaur Axe, and she should rest in the meantime. She offers to tag along with him, as she'd like to level up quickly. He insists they can do the leveling up the next day, as in the meantime, he would prefer she rests. She retaliates that it was his idea to stick together, but if she's such a bother, she'll find a way to level up by herself. So it's been three days since the monsters appeared, and things have gotten quite chaotic since then. So their best option is to tread carefully. Ichijo advises now to walk behind. The damage they come across, cracked floors and broken utility poles, are the work of boar monsters which could still be lurking around. At some point, Ichijo deems now walking so close to the convenience store dangerous and asks her to step back. Now gets irritated and points out he's being overly protective. In Ichijo's defense, there are many high-level monsters and they ought to be as careful as possible. Now responds with the fact that they're underprotected anyway. All they have is a handgun Kashiwaba gave to Ichijo. If she could learn and master magic, they'll be better off. She playfully points the gun at Ichijo, stating it would be cool if the weapon could shoot magic instead of bullets. And Ichijo inwardly realizes she has a childish nature to her. She wonders out loud at the possibility of the Minotaur Axe being where it should. Someone could have easily taken it since it's a powerful weapon. Ichijo disagrees. The self-defense personnel have attempted carrying the weapon and failed. They eventually find the axe half buried in the ground in a deserted street. But the axe will still be difficult to retrieve because it's surrounded by rock birds who are building nests. They have tough skin and release sticky fluids that can slow down an opponent. Now offers to retrieve the axe, but Ichijo steps in. He races towards it and notices he's caught a rock bird's attention. He tells himself he'll need to hurry before the rock bird attacks, but before he can get to the axe, 
he finds himself unable to move, trapped in the sticky fluid he'd missed on the floor. The birds start to circulate him and now yells for him to get down while she charges for an attack of her own. Ichijo panics but now tells him not to underestimate her. She fires the handgun and it releases a bolt of electricity, momentarily scaring off the birds. They however have durability and Ichido decides he has to act fast. He takes out the Minotaur axe from the ground and swings at the birds. Ichijo and Nao team up with Ichijo planning to weaken the birds while Nao finishes them off. For Ichijo, it's surreal, the day he would fight alongside Nao. If only everything would go smoothly. Nao directs Ichijo to another black wolf, which he slices in half with the Minotaur axe. Nao asks him if that was the last of them, which Ichijo affirms. Ichijo then asks Nao what level she was at. Nao tells him that she's at level 23, to which Ichijo praises her, saying that she has made a lot of progress so far. He notes that she's able to level up smoothly because she is leveling up against stronger wolves. Despite this, Nao points out that they keep attacking relentlessly. Ichijo agrees with her, stating that he has killed over 20 of them. He further notes that their aggressive attacks are also influenced by the hostility of the wolf species when obtaining trophies. He adds that he even acquired the wolf slayer hostility, which increased by 40 the other day, so it is even more intense. Ichijo then tells Nao that even so, the difficulty is just right for leveling up and decides that they both rest. Now stumbles a little bit, but Ichijo catches her, asking her if she is okay, to which she tells him that she's fine and that he should not worry about her. He states that she has used up too much stamina from using magic and again, decides that they both take a short break at a nearby bench next to a vending machine. While now sits and enjoys a beverage, Ichijo begins to talk about the axe, saying that it has incredible sharpness and that cutting the black wolf was akin to cutting butter. He also adds that he was surprised when he was using it. He then truly believes that the difference in power between weapons in reality and the Minotaur's axe is so overwhelming that it's terrifying. He then begins to swing it, proudly saying that as long as he has it in his arsenal, he has no problem defeating even a fully upgraded boss. Now, however, is only focused on him swinging the axe and tells him to stop it, saying that it's dangerous for him to be doing that. However, Ichijo remembers that if they die and respawn, then they have to find it again, which would be pretty bothersome. He then has the bright idea of registering the axe in the inventory, considering the possibility that if he does that, then they can still use it after resurrecting from the dead. Now is somewhat amused by this, thinking to herself that he's acting too excited, like a little kid. She ends up being just as motivated as him and she stands up, declaring that she's fine now and wants to continue leveling up. Ichijo insists that they should still rest, but now is adamant that she is fine. Before she can finish her sentence, she hears a gruesome shout coming from the path in front of them. Ichijo speculates that a monster is being attacked in that direction. Now then suggests that it would be better if they went to go help them, which Ichijo agrees to. They then run towards the sound, Ichijo warning now that they should proceed cautiously, stating that it's dangerous to rush in blindly. As they move through the path, they move slower as they get closer to the source of the noise. Ichijo believes that the screaming came from that area. Suddenly, another man comes from around a corner and bumps into Ichijo's axe. Ichijo asks him if he's okay, but the man simply pushes him aside screaming that Ichijo is in the way and that he has to get out of there. Watching the man run away, Ichijo wonders what is going on and if the scream was from him. Now, facing the opposite direction, calls out to Ichijo and points in front of her. Ichijo looks back and to his horror, sees a horde of all kinds of monsters charging towards them. Now panics, wondering why there are so many. Ichijo begins to make a run for it and tells Nao to run, but her legs give out due to fear. She kneels hopelessly, saying that it's no good. As the horde of monsters gets closer, Ichijo turns back and runs to get Nao. Quickly, he carries her and begins to run away. The monsters chase after them and soon can grab Nao away from Ichijo. Ichijo then watches in horror as a black wolf bites into her shoulder and tears off a chunk of her flesh. Then a goblin joins in, until the monsters surround her, tearing her apart as she screams in agonizing pain. Ichijo then uses his sprint skill to run against the walls of the surrounding buildings to try and get Nao back. Once he sees her, he stretches out his hand, but before he could even grab her hand, a giant wasp impales her with its stinger. Within the raging horde of monsters, he holds her body in his hands and cries hysterically. A notification then appears confirming Nao's death and activating the resurrection skill. Ichijo then wakes up in the hospital bed and realizes what just happened. He then heads to Nao's room and asks if she is okay. He tells her that he's about to open her door and enter, but Nao quickly tells him to stop and tells him to leave her alone for the moment. Due to that horrible incident, Nao's mental state has been shattered. Later, Nao finds herself fighting again just before Ichijo wakes up. She had respawned from death. Some soldiers defending her and fighting against giant wasps calls out to her, telling her to hold on. She then remembers that this is where she was just before Ichijo wakes up and realizes that resurrection was activated because she had died. She then decides to join the fight too, but upon seeing the wasps, she's reminded of her gruesome death. This causes her to panic and crouch. 
all while screaming uncontrollably. The soldiers then decide to move now to a safer location. Now is back in her hospital room, still shaking uncontrollably as memories of her death continue to flash through her mind, leaving her scared out of her mind. Ichijo wakes up, vexed that he let now die again. He then wonders if he's truly able to protect now. Suddenly, he hears her screaming. Before he could get up to check on her, one of the soldiers meets him, introducing himself as Karube, stating that he is the lieutenant colonel of the Japan Ground Self-Defense Force. He then remembers that Karube would come to visit him at that time. He then reasons that if the event repeats without incident, then the Black Wolves would begin to attack at night. Karube then asks Ichijo about his power. At first, Ichijo is confused, but then Karobe clarifies that he's referring to the Minotaur axe leaning against the wall next to him. Karobe states that somehow it was there before he woke up. To Ichijo's surprise and relief, he realizes that his decision to register the weapon in his inventory was a smart move. He then responds that it seems to be his power. Ichijo thinks to himself that it is too early to give up. He then stands up when Karobe asks him where he's going. He tells Karobe that since they need him to defeat the boss, then he'll do what needs to be done. He then warns him that there will be an attack from the Black Wolves, so he should not approach the entrance lobby. Meanwhile, he heads to Nao's room and after knocking, announces that he's entering. As he enters, he sees Nao, frightened and cowering in a corner with a blanket over her. He then sits on her bed and apologizes, saying that if he were able to protect her, then she wouldn't have died. In a shaky voice, she tells him not to apologize, saying that it's her fault for being meddlesome with her power and putting him in danger. She then tells him that he's amazing for being able to stand up and keep moving forward despite dying multiple times. On the other hand, she cannot handle herself anymore. She adds that whenever she sees the monsters, flashbacks of the moments before her death rush back through her mind. She then decides that she won't be fighting anymore because she is afraid of them. Ichijo, pained to see her like this, stands up from the bed, crouches, and hugs now, telling her that it is fine and that she does not have to fight. He promises that he will take care of everything and end it all. He promises again that he will not let Nao die again. However, he reminds her that to undo her reviving, they have to complete the scenario of defeating the boss together, so he'll ask for some cooperation in the end. He then tells her that until then, she should rest. He then leaves her to rest, though she doesn't move from the corner and her head is now buried in the blanket. While walking through the hallway, he decides again that he will fight on his own. He remembers that he has always fought on his own and decides that he will continue to do so to avoid causing any more pain to Nao. With that thought out of the way, he believes that the horde of monsters they encountered and the person who caused the Black Wolves to attack the hospital are connected in some way. He then deduces that it is most likely that the boss monster that commands the Black Wolves has arrived in the city they're in and that those monsters weren't attacking them but fleeing, hence the horde which was in truth a large-scale migration. He then decides to investigate the matter. He then sees two people in the lobby and warns them that the monsters were coming and that they should move away immediately. They both question him and he tells them that a pack of black wolves were going to arrive in a few minutes and that it was better to move away before being killed. One of the strangers in uniform then believes that Ichijo is just a troublemaker that lied to Karobe. While Ichijo stays silent, the stranger continues to press him, saying he doesn't like the look Ichijo had in his eyes. The other stranger, not in uniform, then teases that he has made Makimoto, the guy in the uniform, angry. Makimoto then continues, saying that he does not like being bossed around by weaklings. He then grabs Ichijo by his shirt and winds up, ready to punch him, telling him that he's getting extremely angry for no reason. But before Makimoto could do anything, a black wolf appears out of nowhere and pounces on them. Makimoto, scared out of his mind, cowers in fear while Ichijo kills the beast with a simple flick of his hand. Makimoto, now lying on the ground, looks at the whole thing unfold with fear in his eyes. Ichijo looks back at him with a terrifying expression on his face and tells him to stay away if he doesn't want to die. Meanwhile, some soldiers stationed close to the lobby witness what just happened. Karobe warns them to not let their guard down and tells them that if any monsters happen to slip past, it is their responsibility to take care of them. Though one of the soldiers notes that Karobe doesn't seem too worried about that, Karobe then looks in wonder at the man who defeated the boss monster single-handedly and likens him to a demon. Meanwhile, in the lobby, Ichijo has laid waste to many of the black wolves, leaving just one, whimpering and shivering in a corner. Ichijo then tells it that it is deliberately keeping it alive so it should run while it still can. The beast flees, not knowing that by doing so, it is guiding Ichijo to the boss lair. The black wolf then retreats to the boss's lair, which happens to be an abandoned subway station. Ichijo, readying himself, decides to go in. As he walks through the silent, bloodstained subway, he notices that the deeper he goes, the number of corpses increases. He also notices that there is an evil aura resembling that of the Minotaur. Looking down a flight of stairs, he deduces that it is further in. At the bottom of the stairs, he notices a black wolf, possibly the one he spared. On the bottom floor, there are even more black wolves roaming. 
At first, it seems like only a pack until he looks clearer and sees that there's a whole horde of them. He realizes that there are so many wolves that he wouldn't be able to handle all of them without his axe. However, even putting that aside, he senses an ominous presence. He then sees the boss emerge from the darkness, and for the first time in a long time, Ichijo is absolutely horrified. Looking at the monster stats, he is even more terrified. Out of the darkness emerged a giant level 93 werewolf. Scared out of his mind, he realizes the danger he has walked into. The stats of the werewolf completely outmatch his, even going as far as to say that he's in a worse state than when he fought the Minotaur. He even admits that with the axe and with his current capabilities, he would be killed in an instant. He then decides that he has gathered enough reconnaissance and believes it is better to retreat for now. With that in mind, he runs frantically until he's a good distance away from the subway. Panting, he sits down and rests in front of a nearby building. He then admits to himself that though it may take some time, he's no other choice but to level up until he can fight against the boss. Sadly, he still has no idea how to trigger quests against monsters, since with that, he could level up faster. Suddenly, he hears a scuttling noise and turns around, only to see a low-level goblin trying to hide from him. He sighs in relief, seeing it wasn't anything serious, and suddenly realizes that so far, the only quests that he has had were against goblins and minotaurs. He also realizes that even if he was killed by any monsters with a lower level than him, no quests were triggered. Thinking about this, he had a brainwave. He then deduces that quests are only triggered when he is killed by opponents of an equal or higher level than him. Realizing this, he remembers that there were orcs in the neighboring city and decides to test his theory. He makes his way to the neighboring city and continues to run until he hears grunts coming from a broken down house. Looking inside, he finds an orc, crouching and feasting on a dead body. Seeing that the orc had a level of 59, he decided that since it was just about the same as his, then maybe a quest would be triggered. He then begins to taunt the orc telling it that it must be hungry and that if so, he's offering himself as fresh prey, telling it to come closer. The orc charges towards him, raising its spiked club and hits Ichijo with a powerful swing to the head. However, this does nothing to Ichijo except bruise him, much to the shock and fear of the orc. Ichijo then tells him that a single strike wouldn't work and that he should try harder than that and come at him with all his might. The orc then begins to hit Ichijo with all its might and rage, pummeling his left and right. Ichijo then realizes that he made a mistake raising his physical enhancements too much, since that means he wouldn't be able to die easily and that this was going to be a hellish session. The orc stops for a moment, tired from exerting all its strength, and is still shocked to find Ichijo still standing. Ichijo thinks to himself that everything hurts and that he will never get used to dying and that no matter how many times he dies, it's always painful and scary. However, if it means now would die, then he would take her place. No questions asked. He'll keep dying as many times as it takes. A notification then confirms Ichijo's death and announces the activation of the resurrection skill. After being resurrected, Ichijo checks and just as he thought, a new quest had been triggered, this quest requiring him to kill 50 orcs. He then heads to the neighboring town and completes the quest effortlessly, leveling up and gaining 30 points. I guess resurrection sure leaves a good mark and face on Ichijo, which makes this one of those cases where greeting death briefly changes a man. Also, he had a good reason to, saving now even if it means risking his life or dying. His determination is solid and admirable as Ichijo's journey continues. Thanks to completing the quest, he has won 47 points in total and increased his status values for level 17. Though later than expected, he realizes that his mana has recovered and now with this, it was time to improve some abilities and skills. The big question on his mind now is what skill to improve. He then decides to increase the level of his physical regeneration ability as this will help him to heal better and faster. Since he has undergone repeated resurrections, some effects of battle can still be felt. For instance, when he faced the Minotaur, he still feels the effect of that battle now. He had no choice, but 30 points is a lot of consumption. But what has to be done has to be done. To use the remaining points wisely, he decides that he will use it to grab something that might help in facing the boss when the time comes, instead of using it to increase his status value. This is big brain time. He thinks about the best course of action for the future. The boss's speed can be surpassed by his sprint value, so he doesn't put much thought into it. The major concern is the final attack. Ichijo lacks any ability that could pull off a final attack on the boss. For this, he gets a new skill, Strength Booster Level 1, for 15 points. Strength Booster is a strength enhanced version of the sprint skill. It increases the strength of its user for a certain period of time, surpassing the enemy's strength just as the sprint skill increases the speed. Thanks to Strength Booster, he can overcome the werewolf's defense. Ichijo then notices that the points needed to get the skill had increased because when he last saw it, it needed 10 points. He realizes here that point value may depend on the status value and he wonders if it applies to other skills. One thing is left, figuring out the werewolf's attack pattern and what quest will come up if he dies. Ichijo gets ready for some action as his preparations are all set, and all that's left is now's decision. After Ichijo's death is confirmed, he resurrects and all the pain is gone as a result of increasing his physical regeneration ability. It's time for action, and as he heads to where now is, 
He runs into Karabe, who is on his way to check if Ichijo is okay. Karabe is confused and worries if Ichijo is strong enough to move. Ichijo evades the explanation and makes Karabe a promise that he is going to defeat the boss monster. He leaves a confused Karabe and heads for now. When he gets there, he sees that she isn't ready to join him. She is scared of having to face the monsters. Ichijo explains that she doesn't need to join in the fighting as they will just be facing the werewolf first and then proceed to the boss monster. After defeating the boss monster with now, the mission will be complete and a new quest will come up. Now asks if she will attack the monster too. Ichijo tells her that she will only need to attack the boss monster once when they are fighting later. If she attacks once and hides immediately, she should be safe. He promises not to make her die. Ichijo assures her and she is ready to go, as she would only be attacking once as a distraction. Unfortunately, the path they take has a couple of monsters, so Ichijo decides that they take a detour, trying their best to avoid monsters and he apologizes to Nao. Yet again, they run into a giant eyeball spider, which scares Nao so bad, she couldn't mouth words to alert Ichijo. Despite that, Ichijo takes out all the spiders and promises to protect her always. He tells her to look ahead and that everything is alright, causing her to feel reassured and decide she will fight as well. Ichijo then wonders what if he fails the boss fight this time, Nao would not be able to get up again. This spurred the determination to not let her die, and he reassures himself of his victory. He knows the plan and his experience with fighting werewolves. If he stays calm, he will win. Ichijo is determined to win, and with words of encouragement, Nao also makes the move. Akira, Ichijo, and Nao walk through the route leading to the monsters. It's a dark path at the train station, and there are bloodstains everywhere. You can tell that this isn't a regular train station. Akira Ichijo explains the plan again to Nao. According to him, all she has to do is attack the monster once. That way, when he finishes it off, it would also be counted as her mission. Nao nods her head, with her gun in her hand, saying she fully understands. She sure looks a lot braver than she did last time. Could be a good sign. Akira thinks to himself that the boss's henchmen would attack the hospital very soon. Because of that, he knows he must finish the mission as quickly as he can. They continue on their journey for a little while, and then Akira suddenly stops Nao. The system notifies him that he's finally found the monster that previously defeated him. It's a C-class mission that requires Akira and Nao to kill the werewolf. Easy peasy, right? Nao is terrified to say the least when the monster comes out of the dark. Between the werewolf's intimidating size, its very shiny eyes, its hairy body, and its sharp claws, Nao sure does have a lot of reasons to shiver the way she does. Nao suddenly reverts to the Nao that she was a while ago. She asks whether this is truly the monster Akira intends to fight and defeat. For now, the fight is over before it begins, as there is no way she sees them defeating the big bad wolf. The werewolf has the first move as it roars and charges at them, almost looking like it's heading straight for Nao. It takes Akira's intervention with the Minotaur Axe to save Nao and make the monster back off a bit. However, Akira notices the monster is even faster than he expected. He barely got to Nao in time. Nao just stands there, still terrified from the shock of having to encounter this huge beast. Akira decides to face the beast head-on and steadies himself for an attack. To match the werewolf's speed, Akira Ichijo activates his sprint skill. As he now feels they are on equal footing, he charges at the beast with his Minotaur Axe. The war begins and it's a really bloody one, claw and metal constantly banging against each other. The werewolf is a tough dog, but Akira manages to stand his ground and get a few hits in. As he feels like he's drawn all the monster's attention to himself, Akira calls out to Nao, telling her that it's time to attack the werewolf. If she could just send in an attack, then all her work would be done and all that remains would be Akira trying to finish off the monster. Nao takes her weapon and points it right at the werewolf. However, the monster looks at her as if to say, I see you. Immediately, her eyes meet the werewolf's, and she completely loses it. Nao's hands begin to shake, and she drops her weapon in fear, unable to get herself to pick it up again. Nao's little demonstration gets Akira's attention. He's distracted by his partner and is therefore left wide open. The werewolf makes good use of that split-second distraction by using his claws to send Akira sprawling across the train station floor. Now remains in her state of mental block, lamenting to herself about the sheer size and strength of the monster they're facing. Akira Ichijo sees what his partner is facing and he concludes that Now is surely in no shape to fight the battle. Akira decides to go in alone and take care of this one. There should be another boss they can defeat together. Akira activates his new ability, Herculean Strength, and charges at the monster. This skill helps to bridge the gap between the strength level of the fighters, making the fight a whole lot more balanced. Speaking of balance, Akira knocks the werewolf off balance and onto a couple of trains, effectively destroying the trains. I mean, who is using them anyway? Akira continues to be a heavy hitter, landing punches on the werewolf to the point where he can almost smell victory. The monster now looks helpless on the floor, and Akira decided to end it. Using his minotaur axe to give the last strike, Akira jumps high to gain an aerial advantage, and victory had never felt so certain. 
Well, that was until the monster called out three words. Increase of agility. Wait a minute, do monsters also have the ability to activate skills? Akira Ichijo's final strike is delayed due to the unexpected twist from the werewolf. With those words, the monster activates a skill that makes it even faster than it previously was. The werewolf is able to change its position just in time before Akira's minotaur axe lands on its body. Akira is stunned and doesn't have a clue as to what's going on. The savage beast doesn't just stop there. Jumping high in the air, it uses its speed and claws to launch an assault on Akira Ichijo, delivering more than just a few strikes in just a couple of seconds. This sends Akira flying nearly all the way across the train station. As the scary creature approaches again, Akira, in his confusion, takes some time to analyze its new stats. His analysis proves just what he feared. While his level remains at 93, his speed stat has massively increased, dwarfing Akira Ichijo's speed again. The beaten down fighter thinks about it and says that he's never experienced such a thing in previous fights with monsters. When you think about it, along with the werewolf mentioning the name of its skill early on, it seems like these creatures can also make use of skills like the likes of Akira. Akira notices that the werewolf doesn't seem close enough yet. Taking a look, he discovers that the monster is now heading in the opposite direction. Through his quick thinking, Akira can tell that the werewolf is after now. The creature's plan must be to get rid of now first and then attack Akira later. There are lots of things that Akira has let happen, but he is surely not about to let the werewolf go after the most important person in his life, especially after he promised to protect her moments ago. Akira calls the werewolf's attention to himself and mocks it, encouraging it to come after him and drawing away all attention from now. The werewolf sure is in a mood today because it doesn't back down from Akira's challenge. The creature goes at Akira at full speed, using its head to try and throw Akira off balance. Even though Akira can't dodge this move, he crosses his hands and places it across his chest, protecting himself from any major damage. As a result, the attack just pushes Akira further behind but doesn't throw him off the ground. Akira steadies himself for another attack, but the werewolf doesn't plan on using the same method this time. The beast jumps high in the air again, and Akira knows he's seen this one before. The werewolf wants to activate his claw assault again. To protect himself, Akira uses his remaining available points, channeling all of them into magic power. He uses this to activate Sprint again, but he also activates Enhanced Strength to help him go toe-to-toe -to -toe against the beast. The difference in strength level between Akira and the werewolf is once again very little. With his Minotaur Axe, Akira continues to battle the savage beast, matching each blow received with an inflicted strike. Damage is dealt on both sides, but Akira feels like he still has enough stamina to continue the battle. On the other hand, the wolf seems much more tired than it previously did. Akira knows that the time has come for him to end the battle, and for real this time. Using the same move as before, he jumps high up in the air and looks to strike the beast from above using his minotaur axe. While he's still in the air, Akira hears a roar that he can't place where it's coming from. He can't strike the monster properly due to this distraction. Really? Another distraction again? The sounds are faint at first, but then they start getting closer until they are right in front of him. It looks like the werewolf is not alone here, is brought little company. In all of this, Akira only thinks about the person he left behind. If the creatures are truly many, then there's a possibility that they might have gotten now. Akira, you know what to do. Meanwhile, now is further down the tunnel. She wonders why she doesn't hear voices any longer, and wonders whether her partner is safe. As it turns out, she has other pressing concerns at the moment, as a three-headed hungry-looking wolf approaches her. Akira Ichijo faces a powerful werewolf, which is flanked by an intimidating pack of wolves. And yet, at this moment, Akira can only think about his friend and partner, now. Akira Ichijo deeply regrets his decision to involve her in the mission. He had never wished for her to die, but for them to complete the task. Akira Ichijo makes up his mind to find his way back to now no matter what. Akira immediately retreats from the battle in front of him. He who lives today, huh? The wolves follow Akira in hot pursuit, but the man is only focused on saving now. Now is still faced with a problem of her own. A three-headed wolf stands in front of her, ready to take its meal in. She must still be faced with her mental block, because she just stands there and sobs softly, half begging the monsters not to approach her. The three-headed wolf doesn't listen, of course. It approaches now and roars again, prepared to have its meal. Now closes her eyes and prepares for the worst, so it comes as a surprise to her when she remains alive and unharmed after some time. On opening her eyes to see, now sees that Akira has once again come to save her. Akira Ichijo took in the hit for her and is badly injured, yet here he stands, fighting off the monster for her sake. Now calls out Akira and points out he's badly injured. With a smile on her face, Akira Ichijo plays down the injury and once again promises to protect Now from the savage beast. His last words to Now before heading back to the thick of the action were words that encouraged her to hide and save herself, and not to worry about the situation, because he'll take care of everything. Now wonders to herself why Akira is the way he is. Whenever he's beaten down, he always gets up. He also never gives up during times like these. 
always managing to retain a smile on his face. Now would really like to know his inspiration behind all of that. Now remembers a relatively long time ago when she and Akira were still schooling. Even when the boys tried to bully her for some reason, Akira always showed up to protect her. Even when he got beat up so badly, he retained the smile on his face, claiming he was still happy as long as she was safe. Akira Ichijo has surely grown a lot since then, but there's one thing that still hasn't changed, his desire to protect now no matter what. Now looks on again and sees how badly Akira is beaten. It almost evokes those memories. Just like back then, she can't do anything to help Akira. Now criticizes herself for watching the man who always risked everything to protect her, get beat up so badly while she does nothing but cry in a corner. From that moment on, now strengthens her resolve to become a lot more than just a crybaby partner. She pledges to fight the battles together with her partner, effectively becoming his support during these battles. Now concludes that she could decide to remain a crybaby and wait for Akira to save her every time. Or she could just decide to move forward in this hellish world, confronting whatever she has to. Now wipes off her tears, picks up her weapons, and offers support to Akira. The monster has him in a tight corner, so now fires her shock arrow at the creature. Akira is greatly surprised at what now does, but now encourages him not to worry about her so much anymore, promising that they will win the battle together. Well, what a refreshing change of pace. Akira Ichijo could not be more glad that now has overcome her mental block and is now willing to fight. It would be so much easier to deal with these creatures without having to worry about us sobbing now somewhere else. However, now joining him doesn't automatically make things easy for them, especially now that more wolves are approaching them. Right now, it's not just the three-headed wolf who's their opponent. An entire pack of wolves, along with the boss werewolf, is headed their way. Akira knows when to retreat and picks his moment well. He has his minotaur axe in one hand, and he uses the other hand to pick now up, running away from the incoming trouble that would surely prove too much for them. This time, Nao isn't just a passenger on the Akira train. She pulls her own weight by using her skill, Black Arrow, to eliminate as many creatures as possible. She also blasts the train tracks directly behind them, effectively making it impossible for the wolf pack to directly follow them, hence ending the pursuit, at least for now. Akira, Ichijo, and Nao finally come out from the train station into the open city, having put some distance between themselves and the pack of wolves. They decide to rest a little, listening to the physical needs of their body. Akira is hurt and now wants to make sure he's not too hurt. Akira insists to his partner that he's fine, asking her not to worry about him. He admits that the monsters are endless, which is what forced them to retreat. He has little time to analyze his battle with the werewolf now. He tells now about the werewolf's ability to increase its speed through skills. According to Akira, the scary beast also noticed a weakness in him. Whenever he used the strength enhancing skill, his speed usually dropped off a bit. At this rate, Akira admits that losing against the monster is inevitable but he simply has to think of a way to win. That's where Nao comes in, claiming that she might have a way to achieve victory over the monster. At this point, Akira would take as many suggestions as he gets. He encourages Nao to tell him what her idea is. Nao says that it's a dangerous plan, but if it works out the way she sees it, they might just stand a chance of defeating the werewolf. Her idea revolves around her shock arrow skill. The skill becomes stronger with more magical energy absorbed. Nao feels that if she uses her remaining 7 points, channeling them into magic power, then her shock arrow blast would be a whole lot stronger than it usually is. Maybe that extra power would be strong enough to finish the werewolf off. Akira admits that it's a good plan, but he knows that for now to call the plan dangerous, there must be a downside to it. So he asks to know what the flip side is. Well, now says that it takes at least 3 minutes for her to launch her strongest skill attack. The problem is that when she does this absorption, she must remain static and mustn't move. Akira sees where his partner is going with this, and sees the role he must play in all of this. It would seem that his role involves taking on the entire horde of wolves while now absorbs magical energy for 3 minutes. All the guy needs to do is last 3 minutes. It shouldn't be that hard, should it? Now is worried about Akira's ability to fight in his current state, especially because he got beaten up pretty badly in the last fight. She expresses her concern to Akira, but he smiles once again and tells her not to worry about him. Akira tells Now that he believes in her and pleads with her to return the favor by trusting him. The partners almost share a moment, but something immediately ruins it for them. The werewolf and its minions suddenly burst out of the train station and into Akira's location. Well, it took them long enough. At this point, Akira and Nao know their individual roles, so they get down to them immediately. Nao quickly runs off to one of the abandoned houses there to avoid being spotted. Akira, on the other hand, literally has to face his problems head on. This has to be the last battle and both parties look like they're up for it. The wolves charge at Akira Ichijo while he steadies his minotaur axe. The battle is fierce as Akira tries to avoid fatal hits while dishing out a few blows of his own. The minions are currently engaged in battle with Akira. It's said that wolves are stronger when they attack in packs, but one man's determination is helping him go up against a whole pack of wolves. 
Akira takes note of the time and sees that he just needs to last one more minute against these wolves. As long as the boss werewolf doesn't interfere with the fight, things should be alright. Be careful with what you say, Akira. The werewolf jumps high and releases its claw assault skill, throwing multiple blades at Akira, even though he's surrounded by its minions. Akira didn't expect that move. He didn't expect the werewolf to care so little about its pack. So the move hits him along with the pack attacking him. But that's not all there is to it. The werewolf must be hungry for action, because it immediately jumps into the thick of it, sending Akira meters back with its fists. Akira is badly beaten up at this point, and his partner, now, watches on in horror from the building where she hides, now struggles to make herself stay put, as she feels like Akira would die if she doesn't intervene. Then again, she knows that her skill move isn't at full power yet, so it would basically be useless against the werewolf. In the end, she recalls what Akira said about trusting him and decides to follow through with the plan. She must have made the correct choice because in a couple of seconds, the resilient Akira emerges from the ruins and charges at the savage beast. Akira truly doesn't know when to give up, does he? The man versus werewolf battle isn't over yet, as Akira lands punches on the werewolf with all his might. At first, his move destabilizes the creature and throws it off balance. But once it regains its balance, the werewolf regains its clear advantage, delivering attacks that do damage to Akira Ichijo. Akira now lies on the ground, almost unable to move his body. The werewolf relishes the sweet smell of victory as it approaches the fallen warrior. However, Akira isn't done yet. He announces that he has one more card up his sleeve. He calls out to Nao, announcing that it's time for her to steal the spotlight. Nao is fully ready and so is her skill move. Without making the werewolf time and space to run or dodge the move, she skillfully aims her blast directly at the creature, while avoiding Akira who's lying not too far away. The werewolf groans, roars, and shrieks throughout the blast. Its voice is at the highest level until it starts to fade away. In the end, the area is covered in a very bright light that makes it hard to tell the outcome of Nao's blast. Akira and Nao anxiously wait for the outcome of the battle. They know that if the monster manages to survive that move, there will be almost nothing else they can do. Finally, the system notifies them of their quest completion. The monster boss is confirmed dead by the system. Akira heaves a sigh of relief and smiles proudly at Nao's bravery and skills. They can finally rest, at least for now.